Okay, so it's um, three past nine in Bratislava and here is midnight in Arizona. So welcome to everyone. Uh, so <clears throat> welcome to the European Research Infrastructure Meeting 2023. Uh, today, actually, you uh, will attend the meeting of uh, machine learning and we'll talk about uh, what we achieved uh during the uh, machine learning activities um within the machine learning activities uh in the last uh, three years in the project uh for the beginning we have um uh, i need to uh to tell you about the the format of the session today's session is uh, one hour and a half so you can uh, see uh, um four talks practically the sessions they are recorded Everyone, everyone is muted on entry and you cannot unmute yourself without permission. Just please raise your, your hand or write uh, a question in the Q&A. And the one, the, all, the, all of you that you're in the, in the room, <clears throat> so please just raise your hand and uh, Hieronym, who is also co-chair this session, will, will let me know. I, I see you in the screen, so I, I, I can also give you the, the word. So, uh, again, thank you very much for joining this uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, now, share my screen to start with the first uh, with the first contribution. <clears throat> so, my name is Tavri Ivanovsky. I'm a researcher of the at the Astronomy Observatory Astronomical Observatory at Trieste, and I'm the coordinator of the machine learning uh, within the uh, Euro Planet Research Infrastructure Project 2024. So uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm, I'll give you an overview of the machine learning solutions for data analysis and exploitation in planetary science, why uh, we introduced machine learning, why this was uh, important for the European research infrastructure, what is the new thing, what, which are the, the main um, uh, achievements, and what is, on, uh, what, are the, what is the ongoing activity. <clears throat> So uh, practically, a um, few words about the, the idea of machine learning and why uh, we introduced this, why this was implemented in the, in the proposal and we work on this topic. So uh, on the right, you can see two um, actually flows, uh, schematic flow. So uh, hypothesis-driven uh, hypothesis science and data-driven data science. So I want to, to talk about these two uh, concepts. They're completely two uh, uh, different approaches for uh, um, achieving and doing science. So uh, what is the idea? Usually we are used to, to have the, when, you do, when we do science, actually what we have, we have a, some hypothesis, we, have a, we want to develop the theory. After, based on this theory, we want uh, to try this theory with experiment. And once we get the experiment, we, we get some data. Once we get this data, we perform our data analysis and we try to, to get some understanding of the process. In the new era, in the, what we have, we have a different approach which is called data-driven science. So now we have a lot of data sets and streams and practically what we do, once we get the data, we explore the data, we try to get some, um, some pattern, we try to get some something common, something that uh, can explain this data uh, and to try to understand some features of the data of this data to get uh, some uh, hypothesis. So based on this uh, exploration of the data, we get the theory and we perform the data analysis and we uh, end up with understanding. So uh, practically this is, uh, this is um, a new project uh, requires, and in our time, you know, you heard a lot about machine learning and uh, uh, the, the modern data sets actually, they, they contain so much information and uh, that allows actually to, to study, to, to work with this data and to extract information from this data. So uh, what we call it actually um, based on this data, we can get, uh, we perform data mining and we can um, get some uh, 
common features that can bring us to, to the theory, what is written actually on the right side. So data fusion, briefly, data fusion brings knowledge uh, not recognizable in the individual data sets. So uh, we live also in this era of the, the together data, not only from, from one data set, but to, to and from different astro, actually we get from different astrophysical phenomena, for example, in the case of astrophysics or in, in case of planetary science, we want to get uh, data from different data sets so we can uh, we perform data fusion and we get the best of the data when we need, unify this data and uh, the data complexity requires actually machine intelligence to assist the human comprehension and understanding um, practically why machine intelligence here you can see uh, very briefly actually uh, a list of uh, some uh, particular uh, features of this uh, machine intelligence. So on the left, you can see uh, two main groups. So we can get data processing. Uh, so practically, uh, we can get um, uh, the ideas to get, for example, some uh, classification, pattern recognition. We can get uh, quality control of the data. Once we get this data processing, we, we start to go deeper and deeper in analyzing the data. So what is called data mining. And we will have a clustering of the information, uh, classification, again, pattern recognition. We try to, to find hidden correlation within the data. Uh, we have a data farming and data discovery. So it means that once we get uh, um, a lot of data, we try to find, to dig in the data and to find what is in, uh, what we can, uh, uh, not only to, to extract from the data, but to understand what the data uh, tells us. And in the end, we get the, the code design implementation. <clears throat> and this is very important for the, I mean, in, in our era to, to work with this, with this data. So the other important thing is exploration of parameter space <clears throat> in the data science. So the data science is not to study only the uh, huge amounts of data, but the data science actually is to understand and to, to make science of this data. So practically, we we need to perform algorithms and data model choices. We have to <clears throat> actually uh, get what is what are the missing parts and based on uh, some algorithms to actually to or to predict or to learn how particular system can behave based on the data that we can get. And machine learning and practically the <clears throat> machine intelligence allows us to do that. With different algorithms, we get the data, we, uh, we have some training of the data. When we know that what we know the problem, we want to, to get something more from this data. And sometimes we don't, uh, we, you can look in the data, but you cannot get the, the, the right connection in, and the right uh, um, features of this data that can give you a lot of information for science. Some, some, sometimes this data is in, incomplete and we should go further and uh, study this data and to, to understand how we can get the uh, maximum of it. So what is the machine learning in your planet? It's completely new activity. It's response to new needs in the planetary science community because the data coming not only from space missions, but from the observations and also from the lab works, uh, from laboratory experiments, it's uh, it's getting uh, bigger and bigger, bigger. So we have more and more data from more and more <clears throat> uh, different uh, fields, uh, not only in Spain mission, like I mentioned, but uh, you, we can get actually information from any kind of, uh, of science. And uh, well, particularly for the planetary science, which is the main <clears throat> domain of the Euro planet, uh, we realize that we get, uh, well, not extremely huge amount of data, but uh, enough in order to start to, to educate actually the planetary, the planetary scientists and to, uh, to apply machine learning um, in, uh, in the planetary science. So the objectives is, uh, they're listed here. So we have machine learning power data analysis tools optim optimized for planetary science. We integrate expert knowledge on machine learning. We want to provide sustainable open access to the resulting products. We uh, we want to foster the use of machine learning technologies in data-driven space research. And of course, we want to generate and to, to understand what how machine learning can be used to, to the community. So we have, uh, here you see the listed beneficiaries. Uh, practically, all these beneficiaries, they 
they were clustering different science cases. So practically different uh, uh, scientific institutions, they perform their scientific cases. They are <clears throat> actually structured in three main groups, what we, we, we call it clustering. One group is for time series data. You can see these are the, the three particular cases from the three uh, beneficiaries. We have um, other cases which are main, mainly the spectral data cases. And we have scientific cases that <clears throat> uh, that are about the uh, images and image processing. And uh, in the next actually three hours of the machine learning session, you can um, you can see what we achieved with the scientific cases. So the scientific case will be uh, explained, so they'll be shown to you. And after it, uh, we'll explain you how we apply the machine learning tools to them. So, and what we can get from this. Of course, these presentations, they will not be uh, completed. I mean, they'll be complete, but they will not be exhausted in the sense that you can show you how we, we prepare this, uh, how we can do science with machine learning. But this is something that you should try by, by yourself. Uh, so these are the main tasks I want to 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 give you only uh, some details on the task in point two. So we have definition of science case clusters. We created a portal, machine learning portal, uh, GitHub repositories, and we have collaboration with other projects. And the uh, next talk will be about the explore. What is exploring? How this um, this project actually helps us to disseminate and implement. Uh, uh, our uh, machine learning tools, and we have an, uh, uh, also collaboration within different uh, workshop and series. So very briefly, because we are running out of time, uh, very briefly about the scientific cases. So the first group is time series data cases. Uh, it's a bit busy slide here, but you can see it listed the three cases of uh, uh, time series data. So one of them is detection of plasma boundary crossings at planetary magnetospheres and solar wind. It will be presented. Uh, you can get here, you can see the, the link of this case, and you can see very um, um, here in the in, in, in the on the in this um, slide, you can see the um, practically the um, papers or presentation of these cases. The same format that you see for the first case is uh, actually uh, used for the other cases. So you can, the second case is detection classification for interplanetary uh, coronal mass ejections in institute to solar wind data. And in the end, we have in identification magnetospheric boundary crossings in electromagnetic field spacecraft data. All these cases, they'll be performed during the, uh, our session today. Uh, for images cases, the, you can see also these cases, they are completed within the machine learning uh, working package for Europe Planet. Everything what you see in green there, all these cases, they are completed. So we have a GMAP pit science cases and we have GMAP mount science case that you can see on the links in the GitHub and all this documentation, what kind of cases they are. You can find it on these links. And we have a classification of plasma wave emissions in electromagnetic spectra. So this is the sixth case. And we have uh, another case, which was also um, integrated uh, further. It's, it's called PITS, so PITS dete PIT detection, that estimation. Here you can see uh, listed all the people involved in the institution. And once when you refer after later on, on for this uh, talk, you can get and you can um, actually uh, contact these people if you have if you have some questions how to, to run this particular scientific case. So we have uh, also in progress some cases, uh, abundance of asteroids of Earth-like orbits with stereo images. Uh, uh, for the spectral data case, we won cases, we have one completed on the surface composition science case of uh, DLR that we presented uh, today as well. And we have a spectral analysis of planetary mineral uh, interpretation it, that uh, this case will be showed uh, will be shown actually in the second uh, part of the session. We have extra cases in progress, Mars dust storm detection, tropical cyclone tracking, tracking sorry, and Mars landform detection. Uh, what we have, a uh, few more highlights, we have the GitHub repository that you can get all the all these cases. We presented all these cases in various, in various workshops in different uh, conferences uh, during the last uh, three years. And we created machine learning pipelines that can be actually, they were 
there were workshops that we showed how these pipelines work. And the idea of this session is actually uh, twofold. One, from one side, you can show you the scientific cases and we can show you where the cases are, uh, I mean, the pipelines for these cases, where you can find them and how they can be run. And the other case is that once you get these uh, machine learning tools and you have a database that is similar uh, to the data, to the database uh, that uh, is considered in uh, each specific scientific case, if this your database is very close to the one that you have for this particular scientific case, you can use this machine learning tool. So the idea is that we want uh, to, and this is the second actually objective, main objective that it's not the idea to give you only scientific cases and to learn how machine learning to learning, machine learning can be applied to these scientific cases. The idea is if you have cases like that, your scientific case, you can go and look for the particular machine learning tool that has has already been applied to a similar database, and this can help you to to find your algorithm and to create your pipeline and to apply to your data. And now I end up with, uh, with uh, wow, this are how we are standing with the project. And we are in a good health to, to deliver the, um, the, the, all the, the requested, uh, you know, tutorials and uh, demonstrators that we should uh, perform by the end of July. So we can have one year after that to test all these cases and to give us feedback in order to improve this and to, to see what is missing. And uh, now this slide, my actually almost last slide is Explore Platform. Uh, next, um, actually, next talk will be particularly for this Explore Platform. So I'll not talk uh, a lot about that, but this is a platform that um, actually gathers the scientific data applications and we integrated our, uh, our um, scientific cases and our uh, machine learning tools for these particular cases and explore for an explore for platform. So practically, this is another way how we can disseminate and we can uh, actually allow uh, more people to, to get access to this kind of uh, uh, applications. So what is the ongoing activity? We want to integrate the tool in the Explore platform. We prepare the tutorials of the machine learning pipelines to demonstrate these pipelines and to integrate uh, the data in the virtual access uh, applications and uh, services, data services like Vespa. So with this, I end um, and I um, practically we are ready. I'm ready to take questions. I just want to, to tell you that um, in, in the next presentations, you can see the scientific cases one by one. And there will be uh, also present um, some slides how you can run this these particular cases. In the end of the session, in the last half hour, we can have a, like a discussion that uh, the explore uh, colleagues that they will show how this is implemented. They will show one demo how this is implemented in also an explore uh, website, and you can ask questions. So, but. Uh, in any case, if you have any questions after each of the presentation, we'll leave two minutes. So practically the presentation is 30 minutes plus two. Um, and you can have, uh, you can raise, please raise your hand. And if you prefer, we can discuss all this in the end of the, of the meeting. So if you don't ask your question now, you can have your chance to ask your question in the end of the, the session when we have half hour actually discussion on all the cases. So thank you very much. You have any questions? I don't see. <clears throat> there is a hand here. Yeah. Yes. It's more general question, but uh, how do you see uh, we integrate and artificial intelligence with the machine learning? So in these cases. How I can see, sorry, I, how I can see implementation. Uh, how can where, uh, the integration of machine learning with uh, artificial intelligence in these cases? Well, this is what actually I said. Practically, uh, what we, we developed, we developed at, uh, different uh, uh, pipelines for particular scientific cases. The machine learning tools 
that okay. can provide, um, um, you know, uh, uh, provide to actually a way how we can get more from the data. So something that uh, we learn from the data and we can get, for example, in some particular case, we can get predictions. In the other case, we find particular features in the, in the data that can describe more data and we can get some scientific conclusions on that. So the uh, this scientific return is the main scope of this, this case. How we can implement these tools for uh, something to be, uh, okay, further step to implement is something more global like artificial intelligence. It's um, actually something that it's applied in general in all the fields. Practically when you have the machine learning tools, you create uh, uh, like a library of different uh, uh, databases and different tools that can be applied for any kind of uh, uh, of data sets that have similar structure and uh, scientific content. The artificial intelligence can tell you how uh, we can predict and how we can get uh, some data and how this data can be enlar enlarged based on these tools. So the artificial intelligence is a bit um, <clears throat> more than what the machine learning tools can perform in this particular scientific case. But what we are doing on these machine learning tools is a step that can be integrated in a something which is like a, um, um, maybe say a recipe for further studying of the, of the uh, application of the planetary data in artificial intelligence. So, in briefly, what I what I want to to stress here is that the scope of the project is not to apply a global uh, tool for artificial intelligence, but to give you a recipe how when you have a database to apply this machine learning. Okay. So this is the main thing. So I don't know where I answered to the question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any other questions for for this, <clears throat> or we can keep going? We should probably move on, I think, Stavro, because, yes. 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 yes, it's 25 already, yes. Okay, so I stop uh, sharing my screen, and I um, let's move to the other, uh, to the second talk given by Nick, I guess. It'll be given sure. by me. Yeah, you're going to do that because he's in okay. person, so we have an in-person talk. That's maybe nice. <laughs> yes, certainly, that, that was. So okay. can you share yes. this? Please go ahead. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to present actually the Explore project, which was already mentioned by Stavro, and uh, basically the scientific data applications, which are the core of uh, the Explore project, as well as its platform, which was more meant to be a development platform, but proved to be quite useful. So it's uh, kind of a nice result as well. And uh, this is a project that is part of the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 Late Space Program, so uh, Leadership in Enabling uh, Industrial Technologies, uh, which was also put together thanks also to the collaborations that we had here at uh, Europe Planet. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, so the, the PI of the project is actually Nick Cox, which is online. So, but uh, well, since I'm here in person, we thought we could have a, a one person, uh, an in-person talk here since the rest are online. Um, okay, so the, the main objective of the Explore project is to uh, enhance and foster the scientific exploitation of, um, of space data. Okay, so it's Explore is going to produce, uh, Explore is producing enhanced data products and data sets uh, from both uh, space uh, missions, mostly, but also from, uh, from, from uh, ground-based archives. It delivers six uh, uh, scientific data applications, uh, so basically some kind of tools or services that are centered on Gaia data, uh, both galactic and stellar, and also uh, from lunar space mission data, which is both remote sensing and uh, in situ exploration. Uh, so these applications are also delivered in an open approach, uh, so uh, expecting the fair principles, and uh, they are being open source as part of their onboarding to the uh, OSSR, so the Open Science uh, Software Repository. Um, okay, so these are the main uh, six applications that are the, developed within the, the, 
explore project and uh, they cover three domain oops sorry there you go, which covers three domains. Okay, so it's galactic science, stellar science, and lunar science. And the idea, obviously, we could not cover everything with this project, but uh, the idea is that this will also serve as a uh, important role, as a template or blueprint, if you wish, for anyone to adapt them and use to create their own uh, scientific uh, applications. So uh, on the top, uh, the first one on the top left, we have GR, Galactic Ar Archaeology. So this allows users to derive stellar parameters, so effective temperature, metallicity, etc., cetera, uh, from Gaia RBS spectra. Uh, this is using some algorithms that is used for the data release three, and this is led by, um, by the Observatoire Côte d'Azur, uh, which are very involved in the, in the Gaia data releases. Then we have GTOMO that is led by us, by AQST, uh, where basically allows users to extract uh, interstellar extinction uh, from, from a cube, data cube. So basically we have a, a interstellar dust cubes and we using Gaia positions, we can uh, derive extinctions at any position, which can be cumulative or uh, profiles of extinction, which can tell you where uh, dust clouds are. And there has visualization in 1D, also 2D slices and 3D volumes. Um, then we have uh, S-Disco, um, so Spectral Discovery of Stars, and this, what it allows is uh, the exploration and visualization of Gaia, RBS spectra, similarities or, or anomalies. Um, so basically you, you are able to select uh, and preview objects, but using different uh, visual representations like UMAPs, which are dimensionality reduction or anomaly score, etc. So basically imagine you have a spectra of one object and you say, well, I want to see which objects are similar to this one in the whole catalog and it, uh, it will plot it in a way that uh, you can visualize it. And the same way you can see also where there are out, out layers. Then we have uh, the other stellar science case is SFOT, uh, which is kind of a sophisticated uh, spectral energy uh, distribution inference from stars and uh, using again Gaia data, but also ground-based uh, archives. And well, when I say a bit uh, sophisticated is that uh, uh, it's not just plotting the points to, to derive an SCD, but it actually fits a stellar model to it. So you can derive parameters. It can allow for disentangle when two stars are uh, close enough. Uh, so it looks at the proper motions, uh, etc., and also corrects for extinction. And then uh, at the bottom, we have the lunar science uh, uh, applications, which are uh, LXPLO and LX, uh, which uh, basically they, they provide um, an interactive graphic uh, environment to explore the lunar surface at all scales for multi-instrument uh, data sets. So it's basically different ways to explore the lunar surface. Uh, Explore is mostly based on, um, uh, on remote sensing data. Uh, LX is like, let's say more local and allows also for 3D rendering, et cetera. This, um, so just to say that the top two are gonna be uh, shown later by Nick in the second session of the machine learning. And the lunar ones are actually going to be uh, shown uh, in the GMAP session, which is <laughs> going right now. But well, you know, they are all recorded, so, so you can maybe look at them later. Um, OK, um, let me see the next slide. OK, the Explore platform. Uh, so the, the Explore platform is, uh, well, it was a platform as I say, it was meant to be a development platform. It turned out to be kind of nice, and uh, it allows basically developers with a streamlined uh, way to, to a process to deploy, test, and run <coughs> applications, as well as share them. Um, so on the top left, you have a sort of a space browser where um, uh, you can, uh, well, it's like the start screen where you can uh, select your body of interest. At the moment, we have the moon, Mars, and Mercury. Then on the top right, we have a planetary map. So basically here, uh, you can draw a search box. Uh, okay, it's a bit small, but you see a blue kind of a rectangle uh, down there. And uh, you can search parameters to find different types of uh, planetary data from, from different archives. Uh, and these results can be uh, inspected or preview and start if you, want, if you wish in a workspace. 
Then on the bottom left, you have uh, also uh, okay workspace. So the users have a persistent workspace or so sort of a file system uh, where you can save files uh, that can be used for from the different applications. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom right is sort of the, the heart of the, the explorer, which is the, well, call it here, the app market is uh, basically where here you can search or, well, or launch more importantly, the, the, the applications that are in the, in the explorer platforms. So this is also, that point is the starting point for developers to create their own uh, um, uh, applications. Uh, and also to say what we are hosting the Explore um, applications, we are also, uh, the Explore platform also serves to demonstrate and also the EuroPlanet machine learning pipeline tools that are going to be presented in, in this and next session. Okay, so it's a bit more technical, but the, the, the thing is we, have, we, def we define a let's say simple or common design structure for these uh, applications to create these applications so that they are contained in a single Docker image. Uh, this is to facilitate uh, sustainability and interoperability because well, Docker technology is used everywhere. It's very portable, so it's quite useful. And there are two flavors. Uh, uh, one is like a single service app. So here you can think of a sort of a, to create a web interface where you have a, uh, user interface that uh, uh, that is connected uh, to the to the back end uh, with all your code uh, then you have the multi service app so this is a bit more for more complex uh, applications where you are integrating different modules that each is connected uh, to each other uh, using apis uh, and uh, well the idea is that is uh, kind of modular okay um, but the whole point is that well the idea is that we have to deploy only one Docker image. Okay, so that makes it a, a bit simpler. Uh, then at the very bottom, okay, it shows a bit the, the different modules that you, you can attach, so different volumes. I'll talk uh, briefly later about this a bit, but basically as, uh, that can be a specific to the app or from the user, and this can link, this can be linked between each other and be, between different applications. So, uh, okay. So the process, okay, of uh, we use a simple build uh, deploy process, okay, so to create these Docker images that they are then pulled by the platform. So the whole idea is that you prepare your at the top left, you prepare your repository, um, uh, then you create a Docker image, and then you run it. Okay, so uh, then at the bottom you see a few of the steps. Uh, that's a simple procedure. So best you first you build the Docker image from uh, GitLab code. For instance, uh, as per your Docker file, then this Docker image is going to be uh, pushed to the GitLab registry. Then in the step three, this, uh, um, this application is going to be initialized in the Explore platform. So it's referenced in the image registry. And then in the step four, the, the, uh, you can, well, the user can, uh, the developer can add some metadata, can add some uh, set some environmental variables or also uh, define the requirements to run the application. Uh, and finally, well, the open request, the user just can simply uh, run and launch the application. The steps one are automated. So that means if you change your code and then you push it, the, the image gets automatically rebuilt. And also note that this is all very standard technology, so it can be run locally also in, in your computer. Um, okay, so it's been a bit of, well, I'm not sure if you can see here with the contrast on the, on the right, but basically once, let's say, uh, you are on the Splurf platform and you have created your image, the, the only thing, the input that the platform needs is just, it just needs your Docker image. So you provide your URL. Not sure it can be seen from here, at least not from where I'm sitting, but <laughs> maybe you guys were closer. Uh, you can see it, then you can set some configuration parameters. So this can be, like as I mentioned, the minimum requirements to run the application. It can be the port. Uh, you can also specify the mount points or some volumes you want the application to work with. And also some metadata that can be useful for others to search uh, your, your, your uh, application, right? I don't know if you're using some, uh, for instance, in our case, Gaia data, we'll put Gaia or RBS or whatever we are using. Um, so anyway, so once you have your image, you fill in this form and basically you are done. 
Uh, okay, and these are just some snapshots of the plat uh, of the platform. Um, so basically, um, you once you log in. So at the moment, how it works, you have to request us access, and we'll give it to you. Okay, we want to do that maybe automatic. We haven't done that yet. Uh, but basically, on on the top, you can see that you, the SDA, the scientific data applications. There's a drop down menu. You can say, okay, browse the applications and. Uh, and this will bring you to the to the uh, um, application market, which is this. So here we have the six um, among the six applications from the Explore project. Uh, okay, you can search applications. In case one day there are many and need to be searched, but at the moment there are not that many, so it's, uh, you can just scroll down. And then from the right, you can just launch the application. Again, maybe the contract is not great, but. Uh, you can also specify you might have different versions of the application, so you can select it and then uh, uh, you launch it. Also, when the service is running, it will open in a separate tab and you will get uh, also some, you, you have some notifications on what's going on, the service is starting, service is running and, and whatnot. Um, okay, so here, this is just an example of one of the applications. Uh, uh, for instance, you select an application. This is a notebook from a, actually it's a machine learning pipeline that will be described later. This is for the interplanetary coronal mass ejection from the No Center from Andreas. And this will, as I say, open in a new tab. Okay. Um, and just note that the apps uh, will keep running even if you close the tab, but uh, you can just go back to, to, well, to the previous slide and then you see it, uh, you can launch it, again. I mean, you can open it again, not launch it, it is already launched. Uh, also, since this is a kind of a prototype development version of the platform, uh, these instances will be stopped after 48 hours so we don't get users, you know, that are running things and they keep them running and, uh, well, they stress the system a bit. Uh, also important on the left, maybe again, is uh, you. There are different folders, but uh, some of them are. Uh, so as we say, we, the user will have some uh, workspace. But here, uh, there are also some different shell folders. So there is a folder can be data, which contains the data that is bundled with the application itself. So so basically, which is included with the Docker image. Uh, you have application data, which uh, contains a specific data associated. Uh, with the started application, so basically external data that is mounted from, from a shared folder on the platform. Uh, you can also have a folder is uh, app out output. Uh, okay, these are names, but you can change them. Uh, it's, uh, which is uh, used to, to write the results obtaining, you, you know, you, you work with application, you generate some products, and then you can save them to your workspace. And there is also some user uh, data as well. Uh, that links to your workspace and it shares between applications. In any case, all this may, uh, is going to be uh, shown later also uh, by Nick. So, uh, so this was just to give you a bit of a preview about it. And uh, the next slide, uh, please. Uh, yep, here. And that's it. And this is, uh, please uh, feel free to reach us if you want access to, to the platform. And uh, yeah, and that's all. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Geronimo. Thank you very much. And thank you for the time. Actually, you were perfect in time. So are there any questions to Geronimo and to, to Nick for Explore platform? We have time for one quick question. Yeah, I think anyway. we have Luca there. So okay. I have a question. I'm a bit confused. What, what is the difference between those cases that you introduced at the beginning, Galactic, Solar, and Luna? And the apps that you can create doesn't mean that you can uh, create your own machine learning pipeline. So, what what is the connection to the uh, six cases that you presented at the beginning? So, uh, okay, I cannot share anymore. <laughs> but uh, the <laughs> I lost it. So, the six applications that we call the scientific data applications. These are the ones that uh, when we uh, wrote this, the, we say the explore project, we say we're going to do these six applications, okay? okay? So these are defined and those are like deliverables for this project, okay? But, uh, so that's just one thing and that's what we have to deliver for the explore project. Now, because the platform can host, okay, it hosts these SDAs, these six ones, but you can put any other, okay? okay? That's the thing. So now we are also going to be hosting the ones for the machine learning uh, work package or 
any other we can host. Okay, so you can create your own Yes, you can create and put it there. Yes, okay. yes. Yes. Okay, I think uh, I think we should move. Thank you very much. I think we should move to the next uh, talk actually. So I invite uh, thank you, Geronimo. Thank you for the question also. Uh, now we move to the classification of surface composition on the, sur um, the surface of Mercury. And this is the scientific case from DLR, and it will be presented by Mario Damore. So, Mario, please go ahead. Hi. So, thank you for being here. So, I have a very really quick presentation. Let me share my video. Yes. Yes. You see my main screen. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, perfect. okay. Um, so, or do we want to go? So, I get, I will show this one and then I can show the, the other book maybe if, if we have time. Okay. So, as I said, uh, our scientific case is about the supervised classification of the Mercury surface using messenger data. So, the messenger data um, in the specific case are uh, infrared spectro spectroscopy data. So, not imaging, we're talking about spectroscopy single single uh, field of view and we collect all the data from the messenger mission that was almost finished in two, 2015 and this is done because we are also involved with the, the baby colombo mission with a spectrometer and we need this as a footwork to understand how the surface looked like so what information can we extract from the surface even if the spectrometer and it's slightly different range spectral range but this was also a good opportunity to start to work for the data uh, analysis tool that we need to develop for our data. So <clears throat> the goal at the end is to collect all those data. So at the end, those are something like 5 million single spectra. And uh, we gather all them together with a grid in a regular global grid producing an uh, hypercube with 200, almost 200 spectra channel on all surface. And we apply unsupervised technique to uh, put together areas that are spectrally similar, similar in a way that it, it depends on the definition of the specific technique that we apply. The, the whole process is finished, it's also published, and the data that I process are uh, available on Zenodo already publicly, or if you want to go back and grab the original data, so in those link here in the PDS Geoscience, you can get all the calibrated data from the instrument. So the result that we have, if you run the Jupyter Notebook in the Explore platform, it's already there, you will produce something really similar to the, the publication we have out. The only slight difference is the algorithm that I use. In the Explore, I put a really slightly simple classification technique due to the, I don't want to have something like 20 gigabytes RAM for just particular application. The, the one that it's actually implemented is a little bit simpler, but the results are pretty close to the one in the publication. If a user want to run a better model, have to download everything, grab the data, have everything described in our um, repository, and run on their own machine, and it will be exactly the same. What's coming out, out of it, it's a classification map. Actually, you get, as you see here, down there, for the all surface of Mercury covered by the instrument, um, a grid and each grid you have a label that assigned to spectral classes and then you can using the the upper cube even get stuff like the, the average spectra for those classes and see how the variation inside the classes is or how they different are the classes to the average you can do a lot of other analysis and what you have also done you can compare to other data like chemical composition or geomorphological maps doing by um, experts on, and so on so you can infer spectral information and then try to compare with the data from other instrument or from other user and try to understand what those classes means and you can save those uh, output in this example to other format export and give to other users that are not uh, expert in the machine learning and they can actually just open it and work in their preferred tool like a GS tool or any tools that they, they want to use. Uh, if you want to run the model, everything is documented in the GitHub repository that's here down there on the left side and uh, it's everything there, just the data not there because a little bit big. So bigger that right, it's not huge. The, the, I guess they compress it. The Hypercube is a couple of hundred megabytes, but I didn't want to put everything in the repository. 
So it's, there are also a couple of scripts that you can use to download the data from Zenodo, put in the data folder, and then run the code that are in the notebook. I will show you uh, briefly what, how it's done. So you just go to the export platform, you search for uh, this application, run it, and you can run the notebook as, as it is. Just a brief outline of the ML, uh, machine learning tools that we use. What we've done, we, uh, okay, that is the first step is to extract a single spectra, resample all the data, and have a um, initial data format, I mean, data structure that's useful for the machine learning application. Then we apply um, given and component analysis. So actually it's used to project the data in a lower dimension space to compress from, it was 250 or something like those, uh, this uh, number of special feature to a smaller one. Then uh, we use uh, UMAP, so it's a uh, uniform embedding, I don't know what the name, so actually it's a projection that preserves the topology of the data space in a lower number of dimension. Nor it normally it's used to project to a 2D space and then you can actually produce a map out of it that represents your high dimension space. And then on this final data set, we applied a agglomerative clustering that used to group similar observations, similar in the def specific definition that you have in your algorithm. I guess in this case, we I use a Euclidean matrix to define the distance, and this is the matrix used to define the similarity or not similarity of the of the data. And the good point about the agglomerative clustering that it builds for you a tree. It's called a dendrogram that you can use to. Uh, even state at which point you want to cut your tree and define how many classes you want to get out of your case. As you've seen before, I was using three classes because for me, a particular application was a really good representation of the data. So not have too many point, too many classes that you cannot, you have hard time trying to define what, what are the single classes means, but to have enough classes to see difference on the spectral data. So for the future, we want to explore more data fusion with other instruments from, from the messenger data, but even in the future, so we are really near to being on Mercury, start to, to fuse those output with the data, the upcoming data from Mercury. Then, yeah, as I say, to plan all, even the observation for the Bepi Colombo observation on Mercury are in the phase of planning now. And I slightly started to explore other tools like a neural network, or for example, the Rational encoder to extract other representation of the data. And then I want to use the those same technique on single spectra. As I said, I regrid everything to a uniform grid, but it means I have a lot less spectra than the 5 million that you have at the beginning. And I want to find a way to apply on a single spectra to go really deep and see the point difference between, I don't know, inner craters, outer craters, specific structure of Mercury, and so on. So I guess that's it for the presentation. So if you have any question, go on, or I can even show you the export platform. So up to you. I guess I have other yeah, 10 minutes or something like that. Yes, great, Mario. Thank you very much for your presentation and that you were great in time. So uh, there's some questions to, for Mario. Okay, uh, online, I don't see. So uh, in the room, Geronimo, uh, I don't see any. No, I don't see, but we see Mario like still speaking. Yes. He's very good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry? Like, there was some lag, there was something like Mario, ah. like he was still speaking, so <laughs> it was a bit confusing. Okay. No, he's stopped. <laughs> At least you can you can read it. So yeah. <laughs> I think that Mario, maybe maybe we it's better that we continue with the next because we are a bit behind uh, the schedule. And uh, during the last session, uh, when uh, actually Nick and Helm showed the Explore platform, if there's some questions, we can uh, we can address your uh, scientific case again. Okay. So thank you very much, Mario. Again, thank you. So uh, let's keep uh, uh, let's go. Uh, go on and move to the next talk uh, the next talk is about um, the abundance of asteroids in earth-like orbits from stereo images uh, it will be actually given by uh, andreas and uh, david so please go ahead um yeah okay so 
Thanks, Davro, and a very warm welcome also from my side, from Graz, from Austria. And when I say very warm, I mean that literally because there's a freaking heat wave going through. Okay, so I can make this uh, super quick um, because that use case is the one that we picked up last. Um, and let me share my screen. I hope that works. Um, Perfect. Okay, so this use case is actually with a student of mine, Lucas, and with uh, Apostolos Christou, who, like you, Stavro, I believe is currently in um, in Arizona, so he cannot join today, unfortunately. And this is about using machine learning um, to classify meteor light curves that have been collected using a camera setup uh, that I will describe in a second uh, to kind of like observe uh, as the meteors uh, enter Earth's atmosphere. And we want to classify those and we want to build a machine learning approach that allows us to um, to learn something uh, from this. And basically, okay. Uh, so basically we have various uh, research questions formulated. Um, also in the course of the expose that my student had to write, we thought about this uh, quite a bit. And uh, here's what we came up with. And I highlighted uh, some, some key aspects that I personally find interesting from a machine learning perspective. So the overall objective would be to classify meteor light curves using machine learning and computer vision techniques. Uh, the data set is uh, basically uh, like images, grayscale images. So we, we kind of ca can use computer vision, but we can also use uh, other techniques and features that I will uh, elaborate on in a second. So the first thing would be how can meteor light curves be classified with common characteristics using machine learning? That is an important question. And secondly, and somehow related, how are these characteristics uh, related to light curve discriminators used in previous studies, just such as symmetry, onset of flare, meteor type, and so on? So. Um, if you use machine learning, as many of you may know, uh, and you use neural networks and stuff, uh, very often uh, those things are considered to be black boxes and uh, it's not so clear what those quantities mean. But there are kind of like also approaches where you try to have uh, what they call like physics informed machine learning or hybrid modeling, stuff like that, where you also try to identify certain physical quantities um, in the uh, like in, in the process of, of applying machine learning. And in this particular use case, this is something that I'm interested in um, deploying. I will elaborate on this uh, a little bit more later. So uh, the other questions, uh, like you can read them here. Um, so there are, are different other aspects that uh, can be answered or can be addressed in the course of the study. But the most important one uh, for me, uh, at least really are these two that I highlighted in bold. Uh, namely the, the features, which features can be used to, to like classify these systems in a meaningful way. So this is the measurement setup uh, that Apostolos is actually running. There are three cameras with different angles. And I believe um, they're like 60 kilometers apart or so uh, and have a certain coverage. But for us, like from the machine learning perspective, those cameras produce the frames that we're interested in and we get the data and even a, a kind of like uh, readout and translation of the light curves already that comes out of, 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 of those systems. And uh, of course, there are various like parameters available uh, that, that we can then later use as, as direct features in our systems. So uh, we doing data pre-processing, as you can see, there are various challenges. Uh, overall, the, the, the behavior or the, the variance that you expect from such a data set is fairly small, I would say, because uh, those things go super fast. So they, they tend to go in straight lines, um, but you have sort of like uh, cloudiness, like cloudy sky uh, or outside of the field of view, like here, you see it may be very faint. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to see or you oversaturate such that you kind of like, it's so bright that, that you kind of are just capped by the capabilities of your grayscale space uh, that, that you kind of max out there and you lose some information. So those are data related challenges, but it's not too bad overall because um, as I said, those things mostly go straight and uh, therefore it's, it's not that tough a task from a machine learning perspective, but it's a good toy model because it is kind of like, um, yeah, of limited variance. So feature uh, extraction, uh, you can, there, there are various things that you can directly extract, but um, 
more interestingly, there are derived parameters. So it's probably not that, I mean, you can of course uh, cluster and classify using the uh, image data at face value, but you can also extract various quantities like the like curve peak luminosity, pointedness of the curve. So you can imagine, um, and I can show it later, I think I have an image where like, uh, where does the flare or the, the most bright part of this light curve occur? Is it earlier as this thing comes in or is it later? Uh, and, and so on. So the, the light curve uh, has a different shape in, in intensity. So if you plot the grayscale intensity as a, uh, as a function of the parameter that traverses from the starting point where the light curve has been recorded to its end, you get different shapes. And those you can use uh, to kind of classify into different into different groups. And that you can maybe then learn something about uh, whatever chemical composition, things like that um, from those various clusters. Uh, so as far as clustering goes, you can use K-nearest neighbor, you can, do, you can use uh, DB scan, stuff like that, but that's not the most interesting thing here. So in, in also, uh, you know, since we're limited on time, I, I'm gonna jump over and go to this more interesting thing. So this is the, the, the kind of like the meat of this, and this is what I'm most interested in. Uh, we want to use kind of like a kind of simple autoencoder system with a very small latent space to classify those light curves, um, you know, using machine learning. So autoencoders are systems which have a neural network as an encoder part and a neural network as a decoder part. And basically you plug in the input. So this could be uh, the grayscale values along the line or the whole image, whatever. Uh, the, let's say you plug in the whole image as an input, you then condense it down to a smaller dimension representation and then you use the smaller dimension and uh, small dim uh, or smaller dimensional representation to blow up this uh, this thing again to kind of re-obtain your output, and you have a loss function where you simply compare the output to the input. And if you optimize that, you will learn a smaller dimensional representation of your input image. Now, the interesting thing here is because the, the variance is quite limited, and overall, if you look at this to classify this curve, only few a few parameters uh, are necessary because you have a starting point of that line, you have an end point, you have a peak point where the luminosity peaks and maybe two or three other features. But if I give you these numbers, like a, a starting pixel, an end pixel location and a peak luminosity pixel location, you can fairly well reproduce this curve with like three, four, five parameters maybe. And the interesting thing though is since those are neural networks, uh, they tend to kind of um, produce representations which are not straightforwardly interpretable uh, from a physical point of view. Like for example, if you think of a very simple mechanical system like a pendulum, uh, a pendulum can be described uh, in terms of its dynamical behavior by two quantities, uh, namely the angle that it, that it, in, that it kind of like, um, you know, encloses with its equilibrium position and the angular velocity that it currently has. And if you, if I give you those two numbers, you can fully determine uh, the the behavior, the dynamical behavior of the system. And if you produce data of a pendulum, that was something I played with some time ago in in another context, uh, not Europlanet, but in a similar setup, you should be able to learn a latent space representation of phi and phi dot, meaning the angle and its angular velocity. Uh, because those are physic the physical meaningful quantities. But it's not that easy, it turns out, to learn these kind of physical uh, dynamical quantities. So I want to uh, kind of investigate this further in this context, how can we learn a latent space rep representation with meaningful uh, quantities here? So I guess um, that was my last slide. Uh, we don't have results yet because my student had to wrap up tons of courses and classes, but he's looking into this at the moment and um, I'll keep you posted. If you have any questions, uh, reach out anytime. I'm always available for discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. So are there any questions for Andreas? I don't see uh, uh, Maria. Luca here. Luca on the, on the room. Oh. Hey. So we, uh, Okay, maybe Mario first because I saw uh, I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go. Just ahead. a quick one. So I'm not really into neural networks, but just a question: Why did you use autoencoder, or did you plan to use variational autoencoder too? 
So I was looking into it, and they are, seems pretty pretty cool. Absolutely, those things. Uh, absolutely, uh, I played with this as well, even in the context of this uh, of this pendulum mechanical system. But variational autoencoders and autoencoders are two entirely different beasts. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. VAs are kind of like that is what you're doing is uh, uh, graphical modeling and and variational inference. So those are base inspired uh, things, which are absolutely fantastic. I agree. I, I'm also like, I was blown away when I learned about those bad boys. But here, uh, I think the system is so uh, so simple that it is kind of appealing to kind of like really try to just uh, straightforwardly extract the dynamical degrees of freedom. Yeah. Uh, but I agree that that would be a next step, but I, I don't want to overwhelm my student with Anna, this. But, uh... Totally agree. Start with simple. Describe what yep. it doesn't mean the output, and then maybe you can go on to. Do the yes, uh, exactly. Yes, yes. Good, good. Okay. Thank you for that good comment. One. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from the room. Yes, please go ahead. So I, I just want to understand uh, uh, one thing. So this this simple example, I guess, uh, can be solved without the use of machine learning, as I understand the the, the, the problem. So what, what is the added value of machine learning here? Do, are we using it as a, as a test to, to reduce the dimensional uh, parameter space and therefore it can be applied to more complex uh, systems? Or, or, or is it really like a, an application per se of machine learning? Um, so I think it goes twofold. Uh, one thing is that you that those camera produce tons and tons of data, and I think Apostolos recorded data over a span of, of like 10 years or something, so he has tons of data. And uh, you could, of course, hard code those features by hand and then run this script on the data as it is being produced or on the whole data set and then kind of like take it from there. If you now use uh, a machine learning approach, you learn those features that are most suitable to reproduce uh, those things, and that is one of the twofold kind of uh, ways of thinking about this. This would allow you to have some non-interpretable features to to kind of classify or to to kind of dimensionally reduce the representation and work with that very efficiently, and then do a subsequent classification and then study those classif those clusters. And the second thing is, and uh, that is uh, interesting from the machine learning perspective, uh, how can you help the, the system to learn? physically interpretable features that upfront not necessarily are known which ones are the best here. So uh, I don't know, it could be like some statistical parameters of the distribution of the luminosity curves, such as uh, kurtosis uh, or whatever, some higher moments, I, I don't know, but this, this remains to be seen. Um, so I agree, it is kind of like a borderline case where you may want to kind of even like uh, play around and, and, and be creative and have an efficient way of dealing with this. But on the other hand, I think it's also an interesting use case to study exactly that how can you how can you learn meaningful representations with machine learning so it, it kind of goes both ways and i uh, good to see you look uh, i regret that we are not that, that i'm not there so we could discuss more yeah so thank you thank you for both of you so uh are there any questions further questions to andres yes there is another question here on the right um okay. can you hear me yes loud and clear um, I have another question on the autoencoder because I used it in another context, which was globular clusters data. And in that context, the encoder and decoder part were like four convol convolutional layers and four deconvolutional layers. Mm -hmm. Is that the usual way to do that or do you do that differently? Uh, just like some more details on that part. Um, absolutely. I, I think overall you have absolute freedom how you choose those things. So one system that I studied with a one of my uh, one of one of my employees that works in my team. Uh, she's a very bright mathematician. Where we explored VAEs, for example, what we did is we replaced parts. So we studied some differential equations that we tried to interpret in by by means of physical uh, interpretability. And one thing that we did is that we um, we kind of like solved this Durham Liouville problem to, to kind of like, so we have a differential operator and uh, then we kind of uh, produce the eigenvalues and then uh, and the eigenbasis of the system. And then we used a linear combination of this eigenbasis as a decoder because we wanted to learn uh, 
this, or we wanted to train the system to, to solve the Sturm Liouville problem. So this is something I think that you can do that you offer, for example, a decoder of a certain type, which then determines what latent space representation you learn. And if you offer an eigenbasis of this system that, that you know, uh, that satisfies constraints and whatnot, then you kind of force the encoder to learn to solve the eigenvalue problem in a sense, if, if that makes, if, if that means anything to you, I hope. So I think you have freedom to choose how you arrive at this lower dimensional representation and I think you can even exploit this to, to help the system on its way to learn meaningful things. Does that, does that help? Or we yeah. can also discuss offline uh, if, if you want. I'm always available. Just, just, just ping me and we can, we can have a one-on-one -on -one session on this. All right. Thank you. <laughs> sure. You are welcome. Okay. So thank you. And now we should move to the, to the last talk of this, um, of this session. This Yes, first part of the session. So uh, we move to the gym map scientific cases, and I'll give the floor to um, Giacomo. Hello. So please, Giacomo, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, I will talk. I'll try to be very short about this gym map case. But if you have any further question or a more complex question please join the GMAP community. It's the geological community open uh, to everybody that wants to join or um, is interested in the planetary sciences, especially in planetary geological mapping. Uh, so this first case of um, the GMAP, or at least the machine learning applied to GMAP, uh, um, um, to, to G the GMAP project is the landform classification and mapping of um, specific landforms on uh, using deep learning on high resolution data obtained from orbiters. So um, this first um, prime case was applied to pits. Uh, pits and skylights are simply, uh, or at least simply, uh, the um, depressions like um, landforms that occurs at least in almost planets of the solar system, at least the rocky planets, and are like our, uh, or at least the Earth uh, sinkholes. Um, but, for example, on Mars are mostly found on uh, volcanic terrains, not um, karstic terrain, karst terrains. Um, those landforms can form by different, in different situations, by collapses, by uh, the presence of faults or uh, dikes in the subsurface. Uh, but they have all specific um, characteristics in the, in the surface. They are almost a, a circular shape. They have a certain depth with high dark shadows, uh, in, especially when there are big collapses. Uh, and on, most of the time, they can be found aligned. And so this may be connected to uh, other features like lava tubes or cavities in the subsurface. And especially since those may be um, an entrance or a pot potential entrance for future missions to uh, cavities, those are very, very interesting to be um, found, mapped, characterized, and of course uh, um, updated along the time. Because if you if we have some images that can be acquired again um, during several times in the same area, we can see the evolution of these pits and eventually uh, assess the stability of the area, and that can be helpful for further missions. So, in principle, we have very high resolution images from Mars uh, that are around 0 0.3 meters per pixel. But that we have also 6 meters per pixel, 12 meters per pixel, 30, and so on. Uh, so, moving on the specific case, uh, the, 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 the results that we wanted to obtain um, are uh, vectorial data um, of um, the polygons that are representing the shapes of the um, uh, pits or in general those landforms and so uh, mm, the first step was to apply a s simple um, uh, deep learning network uh, named YOLO you only look once uh, that is spe uh, specifically developed for uh, fast um, detection of objects in a scene in the context of course and so the first results were simply the centroids of those bounding boxes and we applied to several images from uh, Horizon and CTX, which are the main high resolution instruments that are uh, orbiting uh, on Mars. And we, we got some good results. In fact, we were able to compare the results with the uh, actual database that 
is av available on Mars. That's named uh, Mars Global Cape Catalog, uh, Candidate Catalog, sorry. Um, then we moved to a more refined result. So we applied some segmentation to our bonding boxes. And so the results that we obtained were masks and masks of shapes, not, not uh, anymore bonding boxes. And so converting masks, um, polygon masks to polygon vectorial data, we obtain a polygon shape. And so we can have more information about this. So we can extract some morphometry like uh, the, the, the size, the, the diameter, for example. And then we can, um, we can move further with those analysis. For example, we can combine those shape with digital elevation models, and then we can extract also the um, depth of the uh, of the detections, or uh, if the dams are um, high, at high resolution and complete, we can extract also volumes, and so uh, this this can lead to more further uh, analysis. But the problem is that in, it's not easy to retrain a model from scratch because you need to have very a thousand of thousands of images. So our approach is to fine tuning a really trained model that were were trained on. Uh, really huge data set based on Earth, of course. Um, and we got, we still got good results. Uh, then we moved to, um, from YOLO, that is mainly an object detection, even if recently it got upgraded to uh, instant segmentation uh, application, uh, we moved to a mask CNN, so more complex uh, segmentation models. And finally, with the introduction, with the introduction uh, this year, early this year of segment anything, we also implemented segment anything with the, at the very um, last step, but I will show you uh, a bit later. Um, so the main result that we can have from this pipeline, so those are the main results that we can obtain, the crop of the detection. So each object that, is, uh, that has been detected is as extracted as a, um, from the image and is a georeferenced image. Of course, if the source image is georeferenced, meaning that we can place again those images in a GIST software like QGIS or ArcGIS, and then we have already we are we are not losing any special information. Uh, then we have also um, YOLO, the bounding boxes of um, the shape as um, saved as a new YOLO uh, label. And, these and also um, the same for the uh, segmentation, but in a Coco JSON format. Those are standard format for YOLO and uh, Coco um, networks, um, Coco based dataset based networks. And those are um, used or can be used to retrain a model. For example, um, our first try was to train on low resolution data, 10 meters per pixel, and then now we are moving to trains. Uh, on five meters per pixel, two meters per pixel. And uh, at the end, we hope to uh, be able to train on 0 0.5 meters per pixel uh, images. But of course, uh, enlarging the data, um, the data resolution will require more power to, to be uh, processed. Uh, but there was also the other results uh, involve the uh, two geo packages, one that which contains the um, cent point centroids of the uh, bounding boxes, and the second one is a mm, simple uh, representation of the shapes of the detections. So those are the common basic results. Uh, but moving to how to run the, the, the machine learning tool, uh, we in this tool, uh, I named it the plan forms, is, uh, mm, is dual. We have a version deployed on Explore platform, uh, that, that is the core, uh, the, is this, uh, this central part in which there are the two notebooks uh, to train the model and then to infer the model and obtain the results in your package, YOLO, and so on. While the overall tool in, uh, um, implement, um, uh, at least has been implemented with also other uh, tools like uh, LabelMe to create the labels um, and the, uh, another tool for uh, always in Docker, um, as Docker images um, or Docker containers to be able to process the source images and be able to combine with the label me tool in order to create the data set. Because the main idea at the end, after or at least while developing this uh, machine learning uh, SDA, uh, we found that mm, 
uh, it may be needed for people that want to um, join or at least to start with these machine learning applications, something to be used as, as simple as possible, yet as customizable as possible. So it can be used from a beginners up to an expert, of course, with certain degrees of uh, application and limitations. So the whole tool implements the whole pipeline that uh, is this um, flowchart that is in the slide here. Uh, and, the, and can be found in the original uh, repository on GitHub and the Europlanet um, Git, uh, Git map, uh, GitHub, sorry. Um, so uh, this tool, uh, oh yeah, sorry, um, as mentioned just before, this tool involves the uh, several tools actually, but the main core is the deep platform that are composed by two Jupyter notebooks, uh, or at least there are four now, uh, two that are based on the Tectron tool from Facebook is the old pipeline, and the newer one that is based on YOLO and segment anything. Um, in theory, to run this, the whole notebook, you don't need, or the, the whole tool, the complete tool, you don't need uh, um, such expertise of difficult configurations. You just uh, clone the repository, then start it with a Docker Compose app, and then it, it will build all the images. And you just need to configure the path to the data and the path to the model. So there's no necessary additional complex uh, configuration. Uh, you can also deploy on server on whatever platform you want because it's compatible uh, with uh, mainly Linux actually. Uh, but if you don't plan to use a GPU, uh, it can be run also on uh, Windows and Mac because there are some problems with uh, the uh, PyTorch pipelines in some cases with the standard image with uh, the that, that requires NVIDIA container base. Uh, but then, uh, what about if you want to customize this, All, uh, both the notebooks or the whole pipeline, you can do it. The, the tool is completely customizable, it's completely open source. There's nothing that is um, um, closed source or is, um, is like limiting the, the, the tool itself. So it can be used also as a playground where you want to test your custom pipelines or you want to um, just to start and map something with some already ready model and so on. So uh, we prepared also the a model and in the plat Explore platform we are just deployed. Uh, we still figure, um, trying to figure it out uh, uh, how it performs on such model, but since the Explore platform is scalable and is uh, in a standardized way, this can be scaled up if you need more resources, you can deploy it elsewhere, but eventually you can also deploy on your custom servers if you don't want to use remote access uh, data or platforms. Um, so the main activities right now is the code optimization, and then we also implement, trying to implement some topological validation to be sure that the detection, detections uh, are not overlapping in case of uh, uh, like mis misclassification or misdetection or missegmentation. So we want to have a, mm, a final result that is ma as much robust as possible. But then we are also trying to implement more additional visualization, uh, more complex vis visualization that are in within the, uh, the notebook itself, like the one I showed you before, um, this one, this is running inside the notebook. Uh, but we want to implement some more functions and more visualization. For example, if you want to plot statistical data for the dimension of the results, um, like instead of moving the data into a GIS software, uh, to implement some GIS uh, functions directly into the notebook itself or into, into the tool itself. Um, but um, part of that, we are also having some other side application of the same data set using other frameworks uh, by two students, uh, actually with uh, Andreas, um, his, his supervisor. Uh, one is for pit detections, uh, so same, similar application, but using a different framework. And another one is the must Mars, uh, Mars dust storm detection using always UNET and with the same or similar uh, framework. So uh, that's all. I hope that um, uh, it was clear enough, but I repeat, if you have any question, please join GMAF and um, we are there to, to assist in, uh, in any uh, geological mapping of planetary uh, data. Thank you very much, Giacomo. So I see already uh, Mario raised his hand and yeah. please go Hi. ahead. Hi. Hi, Giacomo. Nice presentation. Um, Thank you. 
maybe I, I, I was just one moment away. I lost it when you when you show about the segmentation that then you produce the polygon. Uh, the question for the segmentation: How do you produce the test data to uh, use the segmentation? So do you have already a test we, data set? We uh, prepared actually two several oh, two major pipelines. The first pipeline was manually uh, was to use manually labeled data for segmentation. Mm -hmm. I labeled more than four hundred, uh, actually almost one one thousand images of uh, RS images with polygons. Yeah, <laughs> it was really I know, I know a, the pain. a fun job. Um, and then we tried to move it further, but actually the. Um, we test it with this, of course, we train test split the data set. Uh, and then we test it with the, um, the tech friend too, all, um, from Facebook. Uh, we got still good results, but we thought that it could be improved. And the problem with the, the tech friend too is that it requires a lot more data for proper segmentation. We got some results, good results, uh, but our recall, for example, was not very high. And so uh, while the first iteration with object detection was really good, also in recall. So uh, since the, recently they released the Meta um, Facebook uh, developers released the segment anything, in this last iteration, we decided to implement segment anything, which is very good and very powerful segment, even if it is class agnostic, um, to the bounding boxes created by the detect by, by um, the YOLO object detection. So the segmentation now is, is relying uh, as a is, is kind of a second stage. It's instead of being directly segmentation, like, like as, as it was before with detection two, we train a, a segmentation model, and then we test the segmentation model. Now we train a detection model, and then we used um, Segment anything, not train because it's not possible at the moment to train. But as it is, the best model of segment anything applied to this um, bounding boxes to do the segmentation. And then we look. We uh, unfortunately I cannot show. Uh, probably I don't know if we have really really few uh, moments. I have the. Uh, no, it's not loading. Uh, no, okay, uh, no, not this one. Yeah, this one. Uh, I'm not sure. Those are the notebooks, but yeah. Of course, this is based. Uh, the base map is um, uh, biking at not the comparable scale resolution. Uh, but uh, what we saw now that uh, unfortunately I don't know if no, not I don't have it here uh, QGIS. Uh, but the segmentation now, if compared with the uh, old one um, uh, derived by detection two, was way way better. Uh, probably because segment anything has been developed with the specific purpose to segment anything. So it has more refined uh, segmentation algorithms and model. Uh, but one one notice that we saw, and probably this is related to the data set that we use to uh, create the bounding box, or probably there is something to, to be tweaked uh, on the segmentation uh, part, like the image size, is that the segmentation anything phase is kind of conservative. So the shapes are always few pixels small rather than the um, original truth data of the labels. So we tested on both high rise uh, prepared um, segment segmentation labels, and we got mostly the same result, only that the shapes are kind of smaller in some cases. Uh, so we are trying to investigate if this is a matter of the image resolution, because we, at least uh, at the moment, we cannot afford to Tray or uh, infer uh, two gigabytes image uh, um, uh, at each time because it's too large. We don't have enough GPU or CPU resources to process this whole image at once. So we are tiling them or rescaling them to lower resolution. But then if you use the full resolution, you need to retrain the yellow detection algorithms because it, the, if you move from 10 meters per pixel to 0 0.5 meters or one meters per pixel, you start to lose some detection, or at least you have some misclassification. Um, so uh, I don't know if it is covering the your question. Maybe I'm, I got more wider than uh, than the question itself. But the segmentation itself, um, as said, uh, it, it can be achieved both by a real segmenter trained on uh, segmentation um, data, segmented uh, segmentation prepared data. 
as we did, uh, but we found that we have some uh, issues in the proper recall, not in the preci precision of the masks itself, but in the recall. So we are losing some uh, detections. While using uh, a detection, a proper detection, like an object, an object detection first, we, we, we can achieve the same results, or at least a, a result that is mostly identical to the um, uh, ground truth data. I can I quickly um, make yep. a point. Um, it's not a new or your talk, Giacomo. I just got a message from Geronimo that in the hotel they lost power. So they disconnected. Oh. Um, so it's probably a good time, Stavro, to have the break. Yeah. <laughs> and they hope to be yeah. back at 11. Okay, there's okay. some questions. Uh, I saw Nick and also maybe in the room, but yes, um, let's come back at 11 for the. Uh, yeah, for so the let's, let's, hope, let's hope they have power back at 11 to be <laughs> online. <laughs> okay. Yes, and we can, uh, yeah, we can uh, start with these questions maybe just a couple of minutes and we can go further with the with the session okay thank you very much to everyone have a nice break bye -bye. have a good break see, see you soon you bye. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 okay i guess we can start because we have enough people online also on all the speakers so i have the agenda okay so uh, there will be uh, like four talks and sort of a demo session on explore so uh, first presentation actually have quite a few speakers so <laughs> i hope you you organize yourself on how it goes okay uh, but just uh, if you can please try to keep uh, the time okay because as you know at uh, 12.30, we will lose connection, and then, no, I'm kidding, but uh, we'll try to keep um, to keep it on time. Okay, so uh, actually in the first presentation, we'll have two use cases, so we're continuing with the, the machine learning use cases from this uh, machine learning working group. And uh, so first one is on the identification of the magnetospheric boundary crossings in ele electromagnetic field spacecraft data, and that, if I understand well, is will be presented by Jan and Andreas. And then we'll have the second one, which is the classification of plasma wave emissions in electromagnetic spectra, which will be presented by David and Sahib. So, okay, I give you, I believe you start, Jan, so I give you, yeah, words so or mute yourself, please. Thank you. So, good morning. So, Andreas will show the slides in a few seconds, uh, but yes, we start with the science case about identification of uh, shock waves in uh, space plasma data. Okay, so if you can go to the first slide. So what we are doing here is we are trying to identify a crossing of a planetary bow shock by a spacecraft based on the plasma data. So as you can see in this uh, cartoon, a uh, bow shock is created in front of a planet in the solar wind flow. When the solar wind flow hits the obstacle, which in this case is the magnetic field of the Earth, and decelerates to a subsonic speed. And it's called a bow shock because it has this bow-like shape you see in the in the figure here. And it's when a spacecraft crosses this boundary, it's seen in the data as a quite dramatic change in uh, field, electromagnetic field and plasma conditions. So this is what we can see we have in the data and we try to teach the machine learning network to identify such discontinuities. Next one, please. So here is a drawing of uh, the kind of data we are using in this case. So the data is from uh, a fleet of cluster spacecraft, which are orbiting the Earth. We, and they are fitted with a suite of instruments to measure magnetic fields, electric fields, plasma properties, especially the density, velocity. And the advantage is the cluster has been in orbit for 23 years now. So we have lots of data and it has crossed the, the bow shock thousands of times. So we can prepare a large training data set. 
So there is already a, even a publication. So we used a set of uh, crossings which were identified visually by by Krupařová et al, by uh, scientists, and then we try to teach the machine learning, net, teach the neural network using this as a training data set. So one more, please. Uh, so here, the red line shows where the bow shock really is in this figure. So uh, you see that uh, is it, the properties of the plot change in the in the middle. So in the top, this is the electric field where you have a you see a transition from solar wind to the magnetosheath from upstream to downstream, changing the character of the waves in the electric field. But this is not what the network will use. So the network will will focus on the discontinuity in magnetic field data, which is the second plot from the top. You see that the magnetic field is very flat and relatively low in the solar wind, and then the shock crossing is marked by a field discontinuity, and the, the, then the uh, bow shock is uh, then the downstream is more turbulent, and there are changes in other plasma properties as well. So this is the kind of data set uh, we will get. So I'm finished. You can go ahead. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, my student, Hannah Rüdiser, was working on this um, uh, and also on the ICME use case that I'm going to introduce next. And I'm going to speed run this really now because uh, we have another use case that has to go into this slot. So I'm, I'm really going super fast. She developed like a prototype. So she explored the data and developed a very simplistic, very basic prototype uh, that is in the repo here. So I just uh, like threw in a bunch of screenshots so when you later look at the presentation, you can just follow along. So it's it's uh, in, in this Git repo here. And in particular, uh, there is like this IAP pipeline Jupyter notebook here that you can just open. Uh, and there's an explanation and everything and, and parts of what you just heard. And then you just launch one cell after the other. So you the usual thing, you, you pull in the pack, like the standard packages that you need. Uh, you can explore the data a little bit uh, like here. And uh, then in particular, you can pick a few representatives and you see the label being this vertical line uh, that determines in various channels. So this is a multivariate time series. Like here you have the magnetic field components and the total magnetic field that actually follows from the components directly, uh, velocity profiles and so on. Uh, and you see how, how this data looks like as you explore it. And then uh, this is what she did because like uh, for the pipeline that she envisioned, she introduced a frame of a certain width that she creates and, and kind of cuts out a certain region uh, from this time series. And uh, what she did is then because this label is kind of like uh, point-like in a sense, since it only occurs at one spot, she sort of uh, like between zero and one in within that window and at the position of the occurrence of the of the Boshock crossing, she kind of like uh, interpolates and, and lets the label go up to one at, at this point and then lets it go down again, just to kind of smoothen it out a little bit. And then she can also like uh, cut this frame at various positions. So either you have no crossing in the image, so to speak, or you have one crossing at some position in there. That, that's, that's the idea here. And in terms of model, as you can see, this is a 1D conf, uh, like a convolutional neural network that is operating on this particular label. Uh, and uh, you can just follow along in the notebook and execute this, this prototype here. So this is really straightforward. It, it then just trains. So this particular cell here takes care of the training. You can then uh, see how this thing learns. And those are some results. Uh, since this is just a prototype, we, we didn't really look into uh, you know statistical measures yet and confusion matrices and so on that you could also uh, study. But uh, just like you know, seeing how this works. And here are some examples where this works nicely. So what you see is here the multivariate time series. You see the original label uh, that has been treated in this interpolary, in, interpolating uh, fashion that I just told you. And here you see the prediction and you see it responds with the double peak, uh, double peak in, in, in this particular case. But there are other cases 
like here it also is okayish uh, so for example this is the response of the ground truth label this is the response of the prediction but there are also kind of situations like here where this is totally not working so those two peaks are ignored and this is due to um, there being various challenges if you want to take that particular approach i don't think this is the best thing to do in the first place but it was her first shot and it kind of works but uh, i think it would require some more work like hyperparameter tuning and all uh, to get the best out of this model and one could also think of uh, using other models there as well but uh, the baseline is there and you can play with it and um, yeah I think that is about as much as I want to say about this use case um, yeah I'm happy to take any questions or uh, the other use case can take over since we are already running late okay Thank Andreas. Uh, okay, if you want, are there? We can pass to the next uh, um, presentation on the classification of plasma wave emissions, and then we have questions for both of you. Okay, that's okay. So I, if David can, maybe I believe it's David who starts. Uh, he, he, yeah, I'm starting. But uh, Sahib, could you share the slides, please? Yeah, sure. Okay, they are giving you access now. So, okay, so. sorry for that. Uh, But maybe I can start to talk um, yeah. without a slide. So this, the second case we are participating in, it's, it's really targeted on the identification of the wave emissions. And I just want to briefly talk why it's, this is why we are doing it and why it's important for us and for scientists. So since Okay, yeah, it's, it's almost there. Uh, since Jan was talking a bit about that, the our planet or m m more planets are just placed in the solvent in the in the surrounding uh, space. So especially magnetized planets like the Earth and others are trapping electrons and ions, creating the magnetospheres, which are the regions where a lot of plasma processes involving the wave activities occur. The processes inside these cavities or these regions are driven or significantly controlled by the waves. And this is why we are studying them, because then it's affecting also the upper atmosphere and us at, at the Earth. Identification and parameterization of the plasma conditions helping us to improve our understanding, and it's why we are studying the, the plasma. Um, okay, and so we just selected one prominent wave emission which occurs inside the terrestrial magnetosphere, and these are the Horus uh, uh, mode wave emissions. And why they are important? Because these emissions control uh, the, the particle behavior, which can then be scattered from the radiation belts, which are the region with high frequency uh, sorry, high energy particles, they can scatter them and then these particles are lost in the upper atmosphere. Uh, this chorus emission is very prominent. Here on the right side, you can see the time frequency spectrograms, which are like the time series of the, um, of the spectra. And we use these uh, color figures uh, simply for, for the classification of these wave emissions. These wave emissions are uh, appearing like a burst Oh, it means that if it's going to the red color ish, it's it's really intense waves. You can see that these are emissions creating some uh, patches which are structured in time and uh, in frequency. So our main goal is to use the real data again from the cluster mission and use these uh, time frequency spectrograms for the wave identification because we have some data already labeled because there was a thought visually uh, identify these emissions. And now Sahib will take over with the, the machine learning on this. Okay, um, so uh, thank you, David, for the nice introduction. I am Said Joker from the University of Passau and I will take over the machine learning side of this use case. So the task of uh, identifying these chorus wave structures in the magnetic signal can be viewed similar to the task of uh, semantic segmentation, wherein the overarching goal is to separate um, an image uh, or uh, a similar uh, data 
uh, into regions based on semantic similarity. Uh, for instance, uh, separating the foreground from the background uh, or delineating objects um, or regions of interest in the image. So uh, formally speaking, every pixel in the image needs to be labeled with a category label. Uh, and um, yeah, and because these wave-like structures have a visual component to it, we can exploit um, image processing techniques and um, uh, treat this as a problem of image segmentation. Um, so the data that we have is basically um, in frequency time format. So spectrograms are essentially images that can be expressed as, uh, as matrices of uh, shapes uh, with cross height, cross channels. Uh, and um, each pixel then can be represented by its coordinates. Yeah. So the task is to go from the image space um, to the label space where each label is, uh, in our case, a, a binary. Mm, yeah. So formally, uh, we can uh, treat this. So formally, semantic segmentation entails learning this function, um, S, going from the image space to the label space. And um, each, uh, yeah, the label lamp map can be represented basically as a binary matrix in three dimensions with cross height. So um, our primary goal in this use case, uh, I, I would say, is to learn this mapping function. And traditionally, it has been achieved with uh, methods such as uh, clustering methods, such as k-means or uh, Markovian processes. However, in the last few years, deep learning has surpassed these classical methods by a large margin. Um, next, we must recognize that as is the case with most planetary science applications, we have lots of data, but we have very few experts to actually sit down with the data and process them, annotate them. So we must be clever in terms of using as little data uh, as possible uh, for, for training these models. Um, so to get the maximum juice from the select few data. So when we're talking about um, achieving this, one way is to, to look at fine tuning larger models. Uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But before that, let me introduce you to the hype of the moment, which is foundation models. Uh, foundation models such as the like of ChatGPT, as you might have heard, or the newly released Segment Anything model. Uh, and these, uh, the, the essential uh, feature of these models is that they use some kind of prompts, which are essentially inputs from the user to guide the generative process. Um, but because um, because these um, methods require um, the the user to be to interact with the data directly, uh, they're useful when the expert wants to to um, yeah directly either work on the data or create some kind of uh, annotations for the for the training process. So this is basically what we exploit uh, the segment anything model uh, for essentially. So we use it for annotation uh, to uh, to feed uh, supervised labels to our neural network, basically. So um, we use uh, something called box prompts, where the user marks the regions of interest uh, very quickly. And so normally, if you were to annotate, you would have to mark the boundary um, manually, and that is uh, often time consuming. In this case, you can, uh, in a few seconds, um, just quickly mark the, the regions of interest. And uh, this segmenter automatically converts them into a mask that is um, usable. Yeah. So um, with this, we uh, essentially create a data, data set of uh, approximately 60 samples. And uh, we use different um, splits for, for training and uh, validation and testing and so on. Um, yeah. So one way. Um, to to then so yeah when the expert is di directly interacting with the with the data then um you can annotate using the this model but uh when you want to use it on the fly uh you can uh use something called uh yeah, yeah you can fine-tune the the uh, latent space of this uh model as well because uh, essentially the encoder here is quite strong so one could um take a few samples and then train a domain specific decoder from the latent space. And then um, the result is that you would need very few sa samples to actually get the, the representative performance that you're looking for. 
And this is something that we've explored in another line of work for GMAP, uh, where we detect uh, pits on the Martian landscape. And we found out that uh, by exploiting this kind of knowledge distillation route, you can um, yeah, essentially solve the task with less than 10% of the labels that you would actually uh, require otherwise. Yeah, so the other approach is uh, you can, so this is rather radical uh, at this point. You can also go a bit conservative and train a smaller model just by using the annotations that you prepared uh, here. Um, so this is something that we also explored in this use case where we trained uh, models like UNET and uh, FPN. Uh, if you're in the image uh, domain, you might have heard of it. Uh, but they're also very popular now in planetary science segmentation. Um, so we trained a, yeah, we trained uh, an FPN uh, segmentation network uh, that has uh, relatively far fewer parameters to train on and uh, ran some experiments with uh, growing sample size. Uh, so these are only a few select initial experiments. And you can see, as you would expect, the, the trend is upwards with increasing sample size, and we haven't yet uh, reached the, the plateau. But uh, given how the trajectory is, I would assume the plateau would reach somewhere around 60 or 80 samples. However, um, if we were to then go uh, take a step further and go the active learning route where we select the most informative samples, I would assume this, uh, this peak can be achieved much sooner. Yeah, so questions like how little data we, uh, we need to use to get the, the best performance, or how can we adapt to uh, newer data with, with changing distributions? Those are basically um, questions of primary importance uh, to us. Um, so just an overview of some, some sample predictions from the, from the network. So here are the images and here are the ground ground truth that we annotated. Uh, and here are the predictions. In some cases, um, it is quite accurate. But in some cases, you see that uh, uh, the predictions are overhanging. Now, if you were to, to focus on the image, the image seems to have like a, like a mm, persistent signal here. So I don't know if we've actually missed this out in the ground truth or um, yeah, if the, if the model actually um, corrects it, uh, I don't know, we have to investigate, but yeah, I mean, just by eye eyeballing it, uh, both could be reasonable. Uh, yeah, two minutes, Sahib, if you can. Sorry? Two minutes, if you left. Two minutes? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm done, I'm done, actually. So uh, currently we have, um, uh, this use case is mostly in progress. So we have um, um, essentially um, active learning experiments uh, running on the side where we use uh, different sampling criteria. Uh, and we're also looking at automating this active learning pipeline by exploiting the foundation models a bit further so as to further reduce the need uh, for manual effort. Um, the results and the the um, uh, code will be updated. So the repository is under con uh, construction uh, on our, uh, uh, yeah, on our GitHub. Uh, if it interests you in the next few weeks, uh, this will be, yeah, updated. Um, and that'll be all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so are there any questions uh, about any of the two talks, basically the two cases? Yeah, we have a question over there, please. Yeah, yeah maybe there is a mic there, so if yes. uh, you can approach it. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so uh, uh, again, I'm not uh, familiar with your particular application, but uh, you said that uh, the problem is the hard manual labor for to get the training examples. And I was wondering, maybe it's totally not applicable in this situation, but um, have you also thought then about unsupervised learning uh, methods? Sure. Um, the, the, that, that's always the first um, try that one goes for. Uh, the thing with um, this case and a lot of applications is that um, 
data is not separable by linear thresholding. Yeah, so if you're, for example, now looking at the, the frequency histograms here and trying to now say uh, separate out the regions that could be positive uh, purely based on the, the frequency, um, it, it's not going to work uh, because you have the same frequency for both the chorus wave and non-chorus. So in some cases, it's going to be noise. Um, and in other cases, it's going to be actual whistling uh, signature. Yeah. So um, um, I don't know. Yeah, you could you could look at, for example, k-means that has essentially been exploited for uh, image uh, segmentation. And we tried that in this case, but uh, with uh, no good luck. So, um, and that has also been my experience with a lot of um, other data. Um, now you could you could uh, of course make make do with it, uh, but the question remains: Can you do it better with neural networks or? Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, if we're running a little bit late, uh, we're gonna go. You have a question? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna go back to Andreas now. Who's gonna talk about the detection and classification of ICMEs in in situ uh, wind data? So, and Andreas, I'll give a five minute warning. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. All right. So yeah, let's jump right in. Uh, let me share again. Perfect. Good. All right. So this is again uh, my student Hannah, who actually benefited like tremendously from the Europlanet uh, project because like I hired her as a summer intern to work on this project when she was a master's student of physics and had some past experience in both machine learning and planetary science <clears throat> because she, I think, previously was doing an internship at the Institute of Space Science <clears throat> in, in Graz. And I, I kind of like hired her for this internship and then she was like, uh, such a perfect match that we hired her on this spot and now she left unfortunately but good for her because she's now pursuing a phd in the newly formed space weather group at the uh geosphere austria so um this is what this is about so it's uh, interplanetary coronal mass ejections and um again we have multivariate time series very much like we've seen it uh in the earlier use case uh, and now there are various catalogs available and different spacecrafts available. Here, for example, you see the the, uh, the magnetic field components and uh, this has been labeled manually. So there's like a, a start of the event where the ICME runs through and there's an end of the event and there's like a time scale of uh, whatever. Uh, it's so small that I can barely see it, but this is like, uh, I guess if you, days or something or two days uh, or, or something, I don't know. And uh, as you can see, so initially there's a region where, um, or if you eyeball this data, you can immediately see that something is happening here. So the, the components respond strongly to this. Also in various other channels, you see a, a, a strong response. And the idea would be to run um, a, uh, yeah, a machine learning, machine learning pipeline on this catalog that will then tell you when the onset of such a thing occurs and when it ends. All right, so uh, there are various, as I said, catalogs and uh, um, spacecraft available, in particular, the spacecraft wind here and uh, stereo A and B, they're located here and here. So here's the sun and uh, Mercury, Venus and so on. And uh, the parameters in the data set, there are two data sets the, the one that we call the full data set and one that we call the reduced data set. And some of the features are available like in the full data set, some of them are only available and in a reduced way in the reduced data set. So we, she, she trained on, the, on these two data sets. By the way, this is all published in this paper here, um, which, uh, yeah, which came out last year or earlier this year, I forgot. Um, there are also various catalogs available. And here you see kind of like, uh, the number of events uh, over time. So this is in, in the span of, of several years of the same observation basically. And you see that there's quite some variance in, in uh, which uh, events have been picked up and labeled. Uh, there's some agreement in some areas, but there's also a, a lot of like uh, variance going on. And um, here you also see two particular ones uh, and a histogram of the counts of, of events. 
uh, with the, like over the hours of the duration of the event. So this is zero and, and like up to 80 hours here. And um, initially we used uh, kind of like a CNN based, so convolutional neural network based pipeline where we, uh, that was inspired, I think, uh, from some medical application uh, for studying like heart rate uh, time signals. And, uh, but that turned out to be not that good actually. And then we kind of switched over to, uh, like we heard before, UNETs. So a unit is kind of like, uh, also comes from the biomedical uh, uh, like field. Uh, this is kind of like a system where you plug in an image on one side and you have a label in, in terms of a segmentation mask. So every pixel has a class adherence. So like there are two classes in this case, and don't ask me since I have no clue what, what, what kind of particular types of cells or whatever that is in that bio image, but let's just take it as an example. This is from the original paper published in 2015. And you plug in the image into the system and on the right side, a segmentation mask is produced uh, and compared with the label. So you have, this is a very interesting structure and quite powerful. I've used it in, in a variety of different contexts now. And this here is, is also one of the projects where I used UNETs and they turn out to be quite, quite good actually. Um, and uh, the, the way this works is you plug this in, then you have like an array of convolutional layers, very much like you have it in, in a standard CNN uh, with max pooling operations. So you become smaller uh, as you go down to this contraction. And then you have a transpose convolution to upsample uh, on the other side to produce the, uh, the segmentation map. And in addition, you have kind of like, uh, in order to help along the upsampling process from an information theory point of view, you have kind of like this copy and concat operation where the feature map that is being produced as you run your convolutions on these input images are being uh, cropped, copied over and concatenated uh, to the feature map that comes from the upsampling path. And that turns out to be a quite good and robust um, segmentation technique uh, that, yeah, that I used in a variety of contexts uh, successfully. And now how does this apply to a time series uh, segmentation task? So since here, uh, like, different to the earlier use case with the boundary crossings where we had just one instance in time where the crossing occurred. Here we have a beginning and an end. So we can segment out uh, regions uh, over time in which the event is going on or not occurring. And then we get this barcode like structure here. And on this, you can then kind of run your segmentation mask. Normally you would run one dimensional convolutions on this one and can run a unit operating on this multivariate time series data. Now, actually the unit that the one I showed you is the vanilla original unit that came out in 2015. Uh, Hannah then used this variation, which is called the residual unit plus plus from 2019, which is way more involved. So it has residual skip connections. This helps along to maintain the information throughout the system as it is being trained. So th th this has uh, various implications, which are more or less technical. And uh, also um, um, these kind of like, uh, you know, squeeze uh, operations that are going on here, but I'm not going to elaborate on this. So if you're interested in that, I think the reference to this, yeah, is right here. Uh, you can look it up here uh, to, to study the details on this one. But it is a variety of, of, of a unit. So the, the general idea is the same. And uh, as you can see, uh, as you come down in the contraction path, so this would be the, the, the thing where you put the input in, you force it through this bottleneck and then you upsample it again. You kind of increase the feature dimension, but the spatial dimension of the input is being kind of decreased. And uh, the contrary is true on, on, on the other side. And here you can also see those skip connections where information is being transferred over across uh, to the, from the downsampling to the upsampling path to help the system along with its learning. Um, actually, here there's some graphic glitch. It should it should say how many false positives and false negatives uh, we have here, but overall it works quite well. So there are 640 ICMEs in events in the catalog. 720 have been detected. So there were a bunch of false negatives, but false positives as well. But overall, it 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 works. Um, even though the catalog and the quality of the data is not that great. So yeah, uh, you can also look at this in, in our publication. 
So to summarize the theoretical part, uh, we use the res unit plus plus for the automatic detection of the interplanetary uh, coronal mass ejection. Uh, the catalogs are kind of tricky to deal with because the data quality is is not that great, but it kind of like works. Um, as an outlook, uh, one could kind of uh, switch to a probabilistic uh, label or include other information like uh, what's going on uh, on the sun's surface, for example, because if you are able to deduce from a direct solar observation that an ICME is going to occur or that something is happening on the surface, then it, this can help along to, to predict the, uh, the occurrence of an ICME. And um, yeah, how much of the ICME needs to be seen to trigger the automatic detection? So those are questions that you can ask in the context of this model. Uh, or can you improve the detection rate by focusing on events that exhibit a clear shock uh, and sheath region? So this is like the events that have been labeled. If you look at the data closely, there is also a lot of variance in how the signal behaves. So it's some cases are very clear that something is going on. And in other cases, it is kind of debatable. And uh, yeah, can you forecast the duration of an ICME would be another question. So since this is all wrapped up, published, and the code is available, uh, you can run this if you want. Uh, you go to the uh, EPN machine learning repo and uh, go to this particular uh, repository here. And uh, there are the two data sets available, like the full data set and the reduced data set, as well as an explanation on how to use this whole thing and the requirements file for all the packages that you have to pull in. Pull in. Like here, uh, I, I hopped into the, into the full data set folder uh, and there is this train split Jupyter notebook that you can open. And this is where everything is happening. So there's an, a lot of explanation going on. You can set like environment variables uh, to invoke your GPUs, uh, CUDA based like NVIDIA GPUs for training if you have them available. Um, here, I, I skipped over some more trivial things, but here the, the model is being defined uh, and the parameter summary is is kind of printed that you so you, you know exactly what's what's going on here as well. Uh, there are like tons and tons of parameters in this system, as you can see. And then this uh, this small cell here takes care of the training process on the catalog. And um, yeah, that is as much as I wanted to tell you about this use case. Thank you, Andres. It was also mm -hmm. very useful, all the information you give at the end, uh, how to run this. Uh, OK, questions we have. Were there? I have uh, tried to speak to the microphone a bit because sometimes I cannot it's hear right? you. Yeah. Okay. So, hi, Andreas. It's Luke again. So, <laughs> I just wanted to understand uh, how do you validate your, your methodology and how do you measure your forecasting skills? Uh, to assess the quality of the model, you mean? To assess, to assess when, when when you do this this kind of forecasting of ICME, for example, can, can you can you measure your forecasting skills? You know how the system works compared to the reality. But sure, I mean you you have the historic data over uh, also I, I don't know how many years uh, there there should be a backup slide that I have not included, unfortunately. I think on how the, the how the catalog has been prepared for this. So what we did is so we have like several years of data available. And we always have a holdout set uh, completely that, that is not being used for training. You train okay. and test your data, and then you validate on the holdout set, where I think we split it up year-wise uh, also because there is, of course, if you if you compl you cannot, since it's time series data, normally you would scramble your data up completely and then generate uh, data sets, like three data sets, one for training, one for testing, and one for validation. And uh, here though, since this is time series data, I think we kind of did this in a yearly, uh, like on a yearly basis, because it, it, I think um, first of there's the solar cycle, there's the position of earth uh, with respect to the sun. So these kind of things can have an effect. And therefore I think we split it up in 12 month periods and uh, cut out the validation at different positions and try these things out. So I, I didn't include this slide, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, but yeah, this is how you can do it and how we did it. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Any other question or here on the, the room or online? Yes, a question there. Um, um, I have another question, and mm -hmm. part of it is going to be pretty similar to the other one that I made, but like uh, I wanted to understand this one properly because what a UNet does 
it looks really similar to an auto encoder, right? Because it has like an encoder part it, and there's the latent vector like at the bottom of the valley and then it goes um, through a decoder part. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really didn't mm -hmm. understand why you uh, went more for a unit rather than just an auto encoder like in the previous presentation. Um, yes, uh, so if, uh, you, uh, regarding your first statement, yes, the, uh, the overall architecture is uh, autoencoder-like in the sense that you have like an encoder part, a, a kind of latent space and a, a decoder part. But there is a difference here, which is fundamental in the sense that on a normal vanilla autoencoder, you have uh, an input, you force it down to a latent space representation of lower dimension, and then out of this lower dimensional space, you cr you try to recreate your input and compare it against the input that you started off with. So that that, for example, allows you to do dimensional reduction, it allows you to denoise your images and stuff because you always try to recreate what you had from a smaller set of parameters. That's the idea. Here it's kind of different because you have, you, you're not trying to reproduce your output, but you're trying to identify regions of interest in your input data, which is represented by a, in this case, binary mask um, that is then compared against the crown truth mask. So it is kind of like an autoencoder is an unsupervised learning technique and a unit is a supervised learning technique in the sense that you have to have your segmentation mask uh, from the beginning. And it just turns out to be a quite efficient way of, um, of, of segmenting time series data of that type. So it, it worked better than anything else that we tried uh, up to that point. Um, yeah, does that, does that satisfy you, this answer? Yeah, that was really helpful, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the next next talk. So we now go back again to Sahib. And uh, so he's gonna talk about the search for the magnetopause bow shock crossings uh, with messenger data on Mercury. So Sahib, whenever you yeah. want. Yeah, I'll give you also five minutes uh, warning, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So hello, I'm Sahib again and uh, I will now present a part of our work on the Mercury science case, uh, where we try to detect the, the boundary crossings around the, the planet. Uh, this was in collaboration with our uh, Russian partners who are no longer with us, so I will cover the, the science part of it. But uh, since most of you out here are planetary scientists, and so as a computer scientist, I will not uh, delve too much into the physics of it, but I'd rather keep it very short. Uh, but to give a brief overview, um, Mercury, uh, as you might all know, like our planet Earth, has a global magnetic field. And however, due to its uh, tiny size and close proximity to Sun, uh, it's rather uh, very, um, um, yeah, it's, it's heavily influenced by the varying solar wind conditions. So it's highly dynamic. And because of its small size, it's, um, yeah, it's very weak. So it's um, quite challenging. Uh, and but also interesting because similar structures can be found around uh, planet Earth. Yeah, and we can collect much more data uh, around Mercury in a relatively short time. So uh, elaborating a tiny bit more on the, the science part of it, uh, as you might see, so this figure illustrates the, the mechanisms at play. So at first you have a, um, yeah, a stream of uh, plasma charged particles uh, called the solar wind that sets off in the direction of our planets. So as it approaches Mercury um, it, and comes in contact with Mercury's uh, magnetic field, uh, it um, yeah, reaches something called a bow shock that uh, Jan earlier illustrated, it looks like a bow. And so it uh, massively reduces the solar wind speed and spread, spreads it around the planet. Uh, then uh, as, yeah, as uh, the solar wind goes further, it enters or kind of reaches uh, this region called magneto sheath. And then it uh, faces another shock-like phenomena called the magnetopause that happens when it comes in contact with the, the magnetosphere of the planet. And that is basically where uh, the magnetic field dominates over the inter that of the interplanetary magnetic field. So anyway, um, to study these uh, structures, um, um, a mi mission called Messenger was launched. Uh, so the space probe uh, basically orbited Mercury between 11 and, and uh, 15, 
collecting around 4,000 orbits worth of data. And in each, uh, basically in each orbit, it uh, traveled from the interplanetary magnetic field into the, into the bow shock, then into the magnetosphere, uh, into the magneto, um, magneto sheath, then the magnetosphere, and then the entire process in reverse. So in effect, out in the 4,000 orbits, uh, data for 8,000 uh, crossings was collected. And so in order to, to study these uh, mechanisms, a, a catalog of these um, crossings is, uh, yeah, is desired basically from the mission data. Um, so most of the related work uh, in this direction has been uh, primarily knowledge driven. Uh, so we had a few researchers uh, until, well, let's say here, um, that developed, who developed uh, geometric models uh, for these kind of crossings. So um, um, as you might know, geometric models are quite um, uh, deterministic. Uh, and um, so, yeah, and so they tend to provide only an average shape of the, the crossings and can be hard to generalize to, to the um, minute variations in the data. Um, so we proposed to solve this problem uh, uh, first time as a data-driven um, uh, data-driven modeling process uh, by using neural networks. So for this, in yeah, so our research goal basically here was to first build uh, an end-to-end -end discriminative deep learning model capable of uh, detecting these uh, crossings from the raw measurement data, and at the same time to answer how many messenger orbits are actually necessary to to um, obtain a generalizable representative performance across most orbits and also the data that is um, coming in from the new emissions. Um, yeah, so um, to this end, um, basically we first had to prepare the data. Uh, so we, we took the raw signals and uh, made them ready for machine learning, uh, performed a lot bunch of steps, uh, for example, removing the calibration signals uh, so as to be not biased by them and uh, adding other data features like mercury position information, and then splitting the data based on um, orbit boundaries and uh, and then splitting them in a way that they're uh, compatible with the UTC, UTC uh, based time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So a bunch of processes um, for an entire list uh, you could refer to our paper that is uh, published um, at ECML last year. Um, anyway, so now we uh, the first step is to define the problem from the machine learning perspective. So from uh, yeah from this view, given a time series uh, of fixed set of tensors uh, with a window W um, and successive uh, time steps, we got to predict the um, we got to predict a class for each point in the window, and but not only that, we also have to predict the next f time steps so that we do a classification plus forecasting um, at the same time. And this is crucial because then if you can um, show that this works, then this can be applied in real time. Um, uh, anyway, so the data that we prepared, uh, the, the label distribution looked something like this. Uh, so the two crossings of interest that we have are the bow shock and the magnetopause. And as you can see from this, uh, from this table here, that they're massively underrepresented, um, which is not surprising. So this task can be uh, viewed, at, viewed as, as a task of um, rare event detection. Um, so as our first goal, I should have been. <laughs> so first, for our first goal, we um, uh, did an exhaustive architecture search um, to find a suitable model that, that can be used for uh, further experiments. So we we uh, trained a few traditional neural networks and at the same time um, exploited some more advanced uh, hybrid models like the CRNN, which is uh, a combination of convolutions and neural nets, uh, sorry, recurrent neural nets. Um, and that seems to be, um, uh, yeah, that seems to be actually working quite well. Um, and that is uh, also my experience uh, with um, uh, 
with audio signals where, where we try to detect uh, certain rare events in audio signals. So any type of feature, any, any data where you, where you have both these spatial and temporal components um, of importance, uh, these methods, uh, these models are quite useful. So uh, even though we had the, the um, transformer network comparing uh, comparably, uh, working comparably, we chose the CRNN because uh, it has far fewer parameters. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is what it looks like. I will not go into the uh, details. We have the convolution uh, side to the model and the recurrent side. And basically activations from here go to the recurrent. And um, yeah, and then the normal supervised learning process. Um, then we have some results to demonstrate that there's no all fitting and, and then we can look at, uh, some confusion matrices where on the left, we have the precision, uh, based confusion matrix and on the right, we have recall. So recall is consistently, uh, better in our case. So that, and that, that goes on to show that, uh, the, um, boundaries are usually slightly exaggerated at, at the, um, yeah. Even though they're not being so, and then uh, yeah, even though they're not being missed. So essentially, there is a trade-off where the duration is um, yeah is being compromised, or rather, the temporal uh, prediction is being compromised uh, for the sake of not missing a prediction. And this can be viewed uh, in our prediction uh, plots, basically, as you can see. Um, on on the left we have the ground truth and on the right we have uh, the predictions from the model uh, and so the, the this region would be the uh, bow shock um, in yellow and in gray here you have the magnetosphere uh, then you have the magnetopause uh, so the magnet yeah sorry magnetosheath the magnetopause and the magnetosphere and uh, in most cases, we see that the predictions are slightly exaggerated in comparison to the ground truth, and there could be several explanations for this. Uh, we speculate that the labels that we used um, were from another work from uh, from Phil Pot et al. And so we observe that their labeling is a bit too conservative, so it is possible that the, the network is... Um, because it learns based on statistical associations, it is trying to to compensate for for the um, yeah compensate for the conservative approach in the five minutes, Sahif. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I'll try uh, try to. Okay, so having done um, the first part of our work, uh, we now uh, move on to the the more interesting part, which is uh, active learning. So trying to find um, a lower bound on the, uh, or rather the upper bound on the minimum number of orbits required to achieve a satisfactory performance. And so uh, you have to be very clever uh, how you sample the data. Um, we, we usually use uh, some entropy based measures to, to select the most informative orbits and then try to determine uh, the, the uncertainty in predictions. Um, yeah, and in this case, we use uh, Shannon entropy. Um, so we compute the, we first train a model and then run predictions. And then uh, be, uh, for the predictions, we compute the orbit level uncertainty, then uh, order them and then select the most, the top N most informative, essentially. Uh, so this is what our algorithm looks like. I will just run through it. So essentially you have an empty set of training orbits. And so while the set is less than the, the set of all training orbits, you basically uh, run this active learning loop. Uh, you fix the delta N or delta T most uncertain orbits, and then you retrain the, and you do this process iteratively until you find a, like a roof uh, or a point of uh, diminishing marginal returns, uh, so to say. So yeah, we experimented with uh, two kind of two kinds of uh, increment functions. One of them is uh, the linear uh, increment, uh, where you take max of one or n, and the other is uh, with a constant increment. And uh, both of them seem to to be well, 
more or less comparable, but uh, the the linear increment with the linear increment, you sort of reach this upper bound a bit sooner, which is around uh, 500 orbits. So we can go on to show that um, if you take 500 of most informative samples, you don't need much more data to to uh, yeah then perform or get good predictions on the remainder of the uh, orbits. Um, and this is yeah corroborated with the uncertainty plots. So anyway, uh, to conclude, uh, basically from our work in this uh, uh, in this direction, we we found out that the CRNN works very well for this kind of data, and we have uh, good performance on magnetopause signal, and not so much on Boshock because uh, magnetopause is a bit more discernible also visually, and uh, the signatures for for Boshock tend to, to sometimes get confused with that of the interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, recall is always better than precision, which is, I think, desired in this uh, application. Uh, and uh, from, my ex from my active learning experiments, we found out that about two years of uh, Mer Mercury's, two, two Mercury years of data, which is about, I don't know, like 100 uh, or 100, no, 80, 80 days, 150 or 160 Earth days uh, of data is uh, tends to do a reasonable job. Uh, and uh, for the increment, uh, linear increment turns out to be superior. Uh, as part of future work, uh, certainly annotations can be improved, uh, that, but that requires uh, more manual effort. Um, the data can be enriched, of course, with, uh, with additional information. And um, yeah, you can also use clever sampling techniques, such as by observing changes in concept drift. And on that note, we actually have a, another paper uh, using the same data with where we try to do this active learning by detecting drifts in the data and then only take, taking the, uh, the orbits that have uh, a, an actual detected drift, which is a, a significant change in the distribution. Yeah. Um, and that has good results, better than better than this. So that that is already submitted. And um, if that interests you, we can talk about it. <laughs> okay, uh, that's that's all from my side for this now. Uh, yeah, the da data set and the code are again on our um, on our GitHub from the uh, from the project. Um, and the, the these are these will be deployed on the Explore platform. I think that that will be a bit, bit more readily, readily usable than for the user. Thank you. I won't take much more time. <laughs> Thank you, Sahib. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great work. So, um, any any quick question for Sahib in the room or online? Okay. I don't see any hands risen online. Okay, if not, then let's move on to the next presentation, uh, which is going to be by uh, Christian Carli and Sergio Fonte, who is going to be Christian, the presenter on a spectral analysis for planetary minerals. So, Christian. Okay, anyway, I think I will faster because I'm more just introducing the scientific case. So, the, the idea that we, we want to share, and so we are prepared a data set, is to try to be able to detect and uh, understand if we are able and which, uh, within which uh, uh, error the abundance of those minerals that are mainly characterized as rocky planets. So all the inner planets uh, as well uh, our moon and uh, Vesta as well as also several uh, asteroids are mainly characterized by a uh, few minerals and those minerals are uh, plagioclase and some muffin mineral that are olivine orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene the rocks already bring up from apollo uh, uh, show us that for the moonar crust uh, mainly we have rocks related to the high abundance of plagioclase or high or variable abundance of uh, pyroxene, olivine, and plagioclase, as well as it has been recognized by more meteorites and several other meteorites. That 
what we can uh, uh, do by orbiting uh, spacecraft uh, generally is to use the visible to near infrared to uh, explore the spectral characteristic of those minerals and to try to map on the surface of the different planets. Here is just a case from uh, the moon with the M-cube da data, where you can clearly see that the evidence of some minerals, uh, particular parox and olivine, and uh, uh, not showing here, but also plagioclase could be detected, just taking into account some portion of the spectra. Uh, also for Mars, this has been done, and uh, specific uh, 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 spectral indexes that use just a small portion of the entire data set that has been acquired by hyperspectral major, as generally used to identify the minerals, but often we are able in this way to identify the minerals just when the absorption are uh, relatively stronger. Often, when those minerals are mixed, the intensity of the band, and in particular, when those minerals are related to rocks with a very small crystal size, could be less intense. And so here you can see a case where from a region closer to uh, the, 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 the uh, Tarsis Mons, uh, so in the, the Dahlia Planum on Mars, that was not identified as a region related to the pyroxene, uh, was possible to identify the presence of pyroxene and in particular of basaltic rocks that are mainly spectrally defined by pyroxene and not only identify those, but identify the variation in composition and then to give a, a history of the variation of the composition of the lavas, that means an history of the volcanics, history of that, uh, 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 that portion of Mars. Here you have another case where uh, to understand and to improve our capability to understand the uh, uh, not only the detection but the uh, information of those minerals when they are uh, mixed together will be important. Uh, from the surface of Vesta, the dome mission clearly show how generally the uh, surface is characterized by uh, Pyroxene, and so mainly correlated with the meteorites that are called eucrite or awardite, even if in some area there is some variation that could be correlated with the presence of olivine. This was uh, uh, partially detected or uh, assigned to a variation in uh, specific uh, parameters, but still we are not able to use it to identify with a clear uh, capability how much olivine there is with respect to the pyroxene and uh, how much eventually plagioclase we have also in the Ukraine region. So starting from that, that from some work that we did in the past, uh, working on a specific uh, 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 systematic variation in mixtures between <clears throat> some uh, plagioclase that for instance, in this plot are uh, the red uh, uh, diamonds and starting so from 100% of one plagioclase mixed with a, a specific uh, uh, mafic minerals that uh, is a um, combination of two uh, mafic minerals. So in this case, for instance, we have uh, uh, one case where the 100% of uh, mafic N member is characterized by the radia mixture of uh, two pyroxene, or in the bottom case is a radia mixture of uh, uh, two pyroxene and, and, uh, and olivine. That is what generally we have from the rocks uh, characteristics because if we want to have genetically correlated minerals, mapping mineralogy is not uh, easy or almost impossible to separate one to another. We were preparing systematic uh, uh, mixtures between the end member we selected and look into the variation of the composition analyze the different spectral reference. We did this uh, also in two different uh, grain size. This because the grain size play a role in the reference properties, both uh, uh, changing the overall range of reference, sometimes partially the slopes of the reference, uh, and uh, often also the band depth, uh, so the contrast where there is a uh, signature uh, potential uh, uh, helpful to identify those minerals uh, and to characterize them. 
Here you have a case with three different plagioclases at two different grain sizes. You see on the left plot, uh, on the bottom, the plagioclase spectra, uh, in the original plagioclase spectra, then just a continuum removed the plagioclase spectra. And on the uh, left side, the plot of the two uh, mafic mineralogies that we have chosen this for this uh, particular case, both uh, again in two different mix, uh, grain size. So then considering a single grain size, the different uh, end member was uh, mixture in a variable number of abundances to have a systematic variation of the spectral properties between uh, the uh, end member. So starting from the idea to try to understand if you are able from a large database to identify potential end member in uh, our case. So that now can be translated in a uh, laboratory case, but in the future could be then translated to the uh, capability to analyze and to understand which kind of pyroxene olivine or plagioclase could be present in a specific region of Mars, uh, Moon, uh, uh, Mercury, Earth, uh, Vesta, uh, and so on. We have prepared a training database with a selection of uh, uh, some hundreds, I think it was more or less 400 spectra of between uh, pyroxene divided in orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene. So simplifying a little bit the case, but having a larger variability within orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene spectral properties, olivine and plagioclase. And then some mixer mineral with associated relative abundance between uh, those uh, pyroxene, olivine, and plagioclase. Then there is a sort of validation database that is uh, characterized with a, um, a case that I showed before, where we have a lower number of spectra, is 54, uh, characterized by the 10 end members, so three plagioclase, two mafic bases at two different grain size and then the mixtures in between uh, uh, those uh, end members that permit, even if with a uh, lower number, to have a track uh, of uh, the sp spectral properties in a systematic way. Then uh, a third case is more similar to the first one, so with a selection of pyroxene, olivine, plagioclase, and mixed material, we still report the grain size information for this case for all of them but not the relative weight abundance. So the idea will, will be that to understand if we are able from the uh, training data set to understand uh, which is pyroxene, ortho, clean, or olivine, plagioclase, which are the mixture and uh, which abundance of uh, one of those uh, minerals are present in the mixtures, uh, to try to uh, use that for uh, uh, validated by uh, the case that I showed before that has a systematic variation and then to try to re reuse the capability of the training to uh, analyze this test database and to see we are still able to find the similarity, so the same type of pyroxene and so on. Each database have a spectra different one to the other, so there is no the same uh, spectra, uh, so the same sample in the three, in, in more than one uh, database. Uh, and so on. Each uh, spectrum is characterized by 2,151 uh, wavelength. Uh, we have reported the grain size maximum and minimum to characterize the range of the, mat uh, the size of the material. Uh, relatively abundance, where these are, uh, say, not unknown. And the associated mineral phases, so the name of the specific phase, orthopyrox and clinopyrox and olivine or plagiarism with the relatively abundance. And so this is uh, the scientific case that I'm, I presented. Uh, just the last slide to just to remember uh, Maria Teresa Capri that passed away one year ago, more or less, uh, and was from uh, her, uh, we could say, suggestion or uh, in some way uh, scientifically pressure that uh, she started to talk with me, Sergio, uh, Stavro, and Romulo to see if we were able to have some specific case related to the surface of the inner internal bodies to propose to uh, this uh, working group uh, and so then from that start the idea to propose this case so that's all i can stop my presentation here if you have any uh, question and so on for some things i think i will be able to answer for other i think that there are online sergio and stavro that can eventually help me yeah, thank you very much uh, christian
Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'm very sad about the passing of Maria Teresa. So are there any questions uh, for Christian or where also online? Uh, Okay, I don't see anything online either. So thank you again, Christian. Okay, thank you to you. Uh, yes, and we're gonna pass to the to the last uh, presentation of the day, which is gonna be Nick uh, Cox, which is gonna show us the, the Explore platform. So Nick, whenever you, you're ready. You see the screen? Yes, yes, it's good, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so yes, I just wanted to quickly make a live demo of the Explore platform and one or two of the applications. Um, I hope everything will run smoothly. Um, also on your side that you can see things well. Um, so we'll start with that and I think then we have maybe a bit of time for questions about uh, either this or the other uh, use cases that have been shown already. So just to show you here what what Jeronimo um, already showed, we have the Explore platform, so you can log in uh, with your account, and then you can go to apps here, browse apps, where you can search for different uh, applications uh, that exist. So here you can see we have deployed already several of the uh, Europlanet ML science cases, the one that Giacomo showed, the Mercury boundaries, uh, the INCME Andreas showed, Mercury surface classification and so on. And then there are also the Explore applications that uh, that uh, Hernimo mentioned uh, this morning already. So I will show very quickly two of them, GARC and GTOMO. And so I already started them to make sure they were running. And then, uh, you know, you can start by clicking the start button. I hope you can see and once it's running, you can stop or open them. So I have them open here in a separate tab. So if you go here to the GTOMO, this is a application that's particularly interested for, interesting for people that um, study stars or other in, um, galactic objects and want to know how much uh, extinction and dust is um, in the line of sight towards that object or related to uh, to that object. So if we if we um, put in an object, uh, well, for instance, this one, which is a nearby uh, O star, we can um, um, submit. Or if you want to resolve it, submit, and we can get a interstellar uh, extinction profile. So here you can see there's a nearby dust cloud at about 165 parsecs, and after that there's very little dust. Uh, up to uh, slightly more than a kiloparsec. You can also see here the cumulative extinction. So if you have an object at 600 parsec, um, you get an estimation amount about the amount of dust in that line of sight. Now there are several other things you can do. You can also upload a, a list of objects to get all the profiles for a large number of objects. You can also upload a list of objects with a distance to just get the um, integrated extinction. So if you do a large survey or you're studying a cluster or all M, -dwar M dwarfs in the galaxy, you can easily get the extinction towards each of them. Uh, and then you can use that in your in your modeling. Uh, you can also explore this. So this is a 3D cube, which has been uh, inferred using Bayesian uh, inver in inversion uh, from uh, primarily Gaia uh, astrometric data, but complemented with two mass, uh, mostly with two mass uh, photometry. So you can hear, uh, you, you can there, see it. There is a little delay, fast. Nick. Yes. yes so we okay, I try not to go too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so here, and now we just pop hope, up, yeah. you can see the, uh, the, the large map, uh, hopefully. Yes, yes. Um, so you can see this is a slice uh, in the galactic plane. So we are with all of us here in the center at zero, zero. Um, at, the, at the solar position, and we're looking from the top down to the galactic plane. So the galactic center is towards the, uh, what's it's towards the right, and you see all the dust clouds that are in in the local galaxy. 
and you can you can change of course the, the slicing I will do one that makes a bit more sense um, well I always forget if it should be the one way or the other way but up oh. okay so it takes a bit of time sometimes up oh, now I'm doing something wrong up oh, well there you go, not working in live demo as I intended. Anyway, you can try to, oh yeah, I need to fill in these numbers, that's it. Um, you can get different slices and hopefully I have made the right choice. No, I made the wrong choice. So now I'm trying to go in a perpendicular view of the galaxy. Um, so here you can see indeed the perpendicular view. So we are looking mostly into the galactic plane with these dust maps. Because obviously, if you look at higher galactic latitudes, there is very little dust and also very few stars. So we cannot reconstruct the uh, the dust cube um, more than 400 parsecs above the galactic plane. Um, so that's for the GTOMO, basically. Um, you're adding also 3D visualization, which is not ready yet, but it's it's coming soon. And so if you want to use this tool, you can simply send an email, you'll get an account. And as Gronimo said, soon we'll hope to have self-registration available. So you can just create your own account or use your um, Google account or something like that to, uh, to get access. Um, then the second one, quickly, I wanted to show GARC, which is, um, well, maybe not uh, again. It, um, it's a stellar kind of uh, tool, where basically um, you can select. Um, so, in the background, we have um, a, a um, in the back end is running is a, a tool, which is called Matisse, which was developed by uh, Observatoire Côte d'Azur, and which is basically retrieving all stellar stellar parameters from uh, Gaia RVS spectra. So effective temperature, uh, gravity, uh, metallicities, abundances, and so on. And so uh, this tool is, is hidden behind the Gaia data release, uh, but in this way we can make the tool available and users can basically select um, from the entire Gaia, uh, from the public available, available RVS Gaia data. Uh, so you need to know your Gaia ID, uh, you can select them, you can search for them, or you upload your own spectrum, or you provide a list with with uh, star names, uh, Gaia IDs. You can select them, and then you can run. Uh, well, you set some parameters. You can analyze different. Uh, you can select or not to have abundances for individual elements, uh, which takes a bit longer to run. You analyze interstellar features. Uh, you can um, play with the normalization and so on and on. And so this allows you to reproduce, but also to experiment with running the, uh, basically the Gaia RVS uh, pipeline with different parameters to see how that affects the, the results that you get. So you can run that um, like this. I will stop because it takes a while uh, to run, but I have here already some pre-computed results. So you get an output dot text, which basically gives you for each input spectrum the uh, different stellar parameters here. Uh, yeah, those can be uh, plotted, so you can plot different um, different things uh, together. You can color code them um, as well, so you can make your own uh, keel diagram or whichever kind of uh, parameters you want to compare, um, and so on. So that's uh, pretty. Uh, straightforward and then here you can see this little uh, squirrely thing in front is where which you can select the spectrum you want to view so in the bottom here you can select uh, different spectra to plot so here you see both the input the output and the normalized spectrum so you can see here the so the green is the uh, normalized input spectrum and and orange is the uh, model so you can see the fit is quite uh, quite good i would say in this case um, this is by chance because I just selected some random objects. You can see that it's, um, mm, yeah, so we have different objects. I'm, I'm not sure if I can show you an example of a bad one. 
anyway, you can explore those uh, data points. You can download them and save them in your workspace. So everything is saved in your workspace. So you can review them later. Uh, you know, these are different runs. You can review your results and download them uh, as you see fit. So that's very briefly how the platform works. Um, maybe for people that are interested to um, put their own applications, we have some information. Well, we'll have some information on how to do that, but it's pretty simple as Jonimo uh, showed you, you. You have to be developer, so you have to request developer status. Um, um, so we, we don't um, assign developer status uh, automatically to adjust anyone, but we need to have a bit of a discussion on what you want to do. And then, as, as Jonimo said, you fill in some basic stuff like your link to your Docker image, some other parameters and the resources your app needs and so on. And, and that's uh, basically it. So with that, um, I think it's a good time to stop this. I uh, have a bit of time still for questions, um, either about Explore, about the different apps we have, uh, or about any of the machine learning use cases that we heard of this morning. Um, I think we have still a bit of time before you. Yeah, drive thank you. For lunch. Yeah, thank you, Anik. Okay. Okay, so questions for Nick or for any other speaker also, since we are at the end. Go ahead. So I have uh, two, two, two questions, maybe more, but let's, let's start with two. So the first question is, let's say that I want to create an app. Uh, I see a lot of um, uh, graphical features. So uh, is it me that I have to produce all the uh, graphics and all the, all the uh you know, the, the, the tools that will be displayed on Explore or is it done at the uh, platform level? That's the first question. And the second question I have is, do you have a, a statistics of your users? So who, who is using these applications which are already there? Is it mainly for, you know, training? Is it for doing research? Is it for, for like um, amateurs who like to explore? Okay, so thanks a lot Luca, for your question. So the first question, do you have to uh, make everything yourself? Uh, in principle, yes, but we offer these, um, these um, examples as open source, so you can, um, based on that, uh, your own work, you can adapt the user interface, uh, for example. Um, on the, on the other hand, I mean, the only thing you need to prepare or only thing is a is, is some kind of application that uh, um, makes a display to a port in a web browser. And you can use, I mean, there's, there's some very nice, fairly simple for non-specialists, non-computer scientists uh, to uh, use, like uh, you have the uh, plot uh, dash uh, um module in python or bokeh and you can easily create uh, these kind of web applications with a little bit of time but it's it's not very complicated uh i know because i'm not a computer scientist i'm not a developer and i managed to create this gtomo thing um so that's the on the first question the second question um is uh on the user statistics so on, for the Gitomo, we have the most uh, the most insight. The other apps have been uh, less uh, less advanced. Uh, we have about well, I'm not should not make up, but I think the last count was somewhere around eighty users that have registered, and most of them are are researchers or from PhD students to more senior researchers that simply need um, yeah, I think in the most cases to have information on the extinction or the uh, Extinction profile for uh, sources of interest that they that they study. And so of course, you can also open yes. up. Yeah, it's mostly for research. Yes, of course, anyone is welcome. I, I I'm we are not discriminating on people that request access. Um, if if it's useful for high schools or teachers, um, by all means, we, we we would hope that they can use it. But but if I understand, sorry, if I can add one thing. But if I understand correctly. The underlying uh, uh, concept is that whatever we put in Explorer has to have a, a machine learning component behind it, right? To no, 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 that, that's, no, no, oh, that's no. not necessarily, no. No, no, it's just that uh, we happen to be involved with your Planet ML, so that's why 
we have the ML there and also Explorer is implementing some of the ML parts. Uh, I mean, these are parts of the application, so it can be any application. Uh, okay. as, 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 as we showed in the slides, you can launch a Jupyter lab, which has your notebooks in it, um, et cetera. It can be anything. Um, of course, we we are. I mean, the the system is limited in computational resources at the moment, so we we are not opening it up for just anyone to deploy machine uh, any app. So I mean, we're not there to have uh, games or stuff like that. Of course, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have to be a bit selective, and we selective to be in the area of space science. Basically, um, that's that's all possible. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I see Stavro raising a hand online. Yes. Okay, so I'm awake. So he's awake. Okay. So. Yeah, just we we are just completing the two, two <laughs> hours. Uh, actually, the three, the three hours of our session. So I want to thank uh, everyone participating in these sessions, and to to ask actually every all the attendants to attend this. Actually, if they have questions that we are uh, available to any questions to any support to explain all the products that we we, we have and this is ongoing activity and uh, the next one year you can have also statistics of how many people use these tools we have this opportunity with explore which is integrated now with the with this tool so uh, just um, go check uh, the test try the, the the cases and if you have any questions please uh, don't hesitate to to contact us so if you, Geronimo, yes, uh, if you have some final words also like a chair of the session, you and Nick, I just want to thank you again. If you want to close the session, I want to thank everyone. Okay, yeah, okay. Thanks everyone. And uh, we're right on time for lunch. So. Thank you. And thanks, Estravo, for staying awake. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Thank you.